second reading on the guidance of order. And uh, let me greet uh, the presence of our uh, good minority speaker, Senator Franklin Gerdon. We would also like to uh, greet the presence of uh, Senator Amy Marcos. Uh, with that, let me uh, direct the to number of persons for this morning. From sec, you may acknowledge your resource person. I'm logging right now for the Department of Finance. We have Ms. Rosalia V. De Leon, the National Treasurer. With Ms. Anika Sarmiento, Mr. Chen Tan, Mr. James Sarmiento, Ms. Lisa Salapantan, and Kyle or Gilie Francisco. For the Land Bank of the Philippines, we have Mr. Karel D. Halo, Vice President for Treasury and Investment Banking Se Sector. Mr. Gonzalo Benjamin A. Bongolan, Senior Vice President, Investment Banking Group. Mr. Guillen Angelo S. Tumalagan, ABP, Chief Market, Market Economist. For the Development Bank of the Philippines, we have Ms. Ivy Canlas. For the National Economic Development Authority, we have Ms. Melanie Grace A. Quintos, the OIC Division Chief of the National Planning and Policy uh, Staff. Ms. Esther O. Kinuta, Supervising ETS for the Trade Services and Industry Staff. We have Ms. Ma Maria e Maevet Santos of the NPPS, Ms. Rosaline Rodillas, Mr. David or David Mangalindaan, and Ms. Maria Antoinette Pasquin. For the Banco Central ng Pilipinas, we have Ms. Illuminada Sikat, Assistant Governor for the Monetary Policy Subsector, Attorney Arifa A. Ala, Managing Director, Financial Supervision, Subsector 3, Ms. Maria Belinda G. Karaan, Managing Director, Financial Supervision, Subsector 2, Ms. Mary Ann L. Kube, Director, Financial Supervision Department. Attorney Jocelyn Angelita C. Angeles, Deputy Director, Office of the General Counsel and Legal Services. Sir Paul Raymond Alhambra, Bank Officer, Department of Economic Research. Mr. Jade Eric Redoblado, Bank Officer, Center for Italian Financial Policy. Sir, Cruz. For the Commission on Audit, we have the following Attorney Fabian K. De Los Santos, uh, Office of the Director, Cluster One, Corporate Government Sector, Mr. Rochi J. Felices from the Government Corporate Sector, also Supervising Auditor of the Landmark of the Philippines, Ms. Marie Franz Hazel S. Acevedo, uh, Active Supervising Auditor, Development Bank of the Philippines, Cluster One. Corporate Government Sector and Attorney Christine Esco, Legal Affairs Office of Legal Services Sector. For the Financial Executive Institute of the Philippines or Phoenix, we have Mr. Ronnie Shasoiko, member of the National Affairs Committee. For the Supply Chain Management Association of the Philippines, we have Mr. Pierre Carlo Coray or Coray. For the Air Carriers Association of the Philippines, we have Attorney Roberto Olim. Uh, the Vice Chairman and Executive Director, we have Mr. Ricky Isla, the President and CEO of Philippines Air Asia, Attorney MJ Navarro, Ms. Ines Jose, and Mr. Jordan Cabonce. Uh, for the Association of Filipino Franchisers Inc., we have Mr. Enrique Pablo Caeg, the Chairman. Uh, that's all for the meantime, Mr. Chair. Good morning. Thank you, thank you, Comsec. Uh, this is the second public hearing for the guide bill. And today we also invited the uh, members of uh, the private sector, specifically some associations of um, MSMEs 
and some uh, groups uh, that are considered strategically important uh, companies. Uh, we will start off with um, um, a presentation from the DOF and its uh, attached agencies and uh, affiliates. Uh, we have a few uh, uh, leftover queries from our good senators and uh, we want uh, the DOF as well as uh, Land Bank and DBT to uh, continue their uh, discussions and explanation on the leftover questions from last uh, hearing, uh, particularly on the direct benefit. Okay? To put it simply, how can this bill uh, preserve employment and preserve value of our companies and uh, assist in the recovery of our economy battered by the uh, COVID virus? Uh, and then late, later on, we will call upon our uh, uh, private sector, different members of our private sector, to uh, also uh, weigh in on the proposed measure. And we would like to hear from them, uh, assist their uh, survivability, as well as join in the recovery of... Um, so with that, we would like to hear some comments. Our Senator Frank, any Yes, yes. Uh, Senator Wynn, yeah. Uh, as, you, as you stated, this is the second hearing. What I would like to hear from our resource persons uh, is, you know, this is a, a, a GOCC, in effect, which is formed to try to provide... Uh, assistance to those companies which are in danger of insolvency because of the COVID-19. Uh, you know, question in my mind is, can the, can, the, uh, can, can the resource persons respond to this? How much did the economy lose because of the COVID-19? In terms of uh, absolute figures, what does 9.5 uh, per present contraction in the economy translate in terms of absolute pesos and centavos, just to give us an idea of uh, the, the effect of COVID-19. Uh, and uh, how, how would the proposed uh, measure guide address this, uh, given what? We, how much is the fund? $45 billion? For example, an obvious uh, industry uh, that would need assistance would be the airlines, transportation sector, one of the most hardest hit. So, uh, and let's be specific, Philippine Airlines and uh, uh, Cebu Pacific, these are two companies who, who would be... Uh, uh, immensely qualified to avail of this assistance. What kind of assistance can a 45 billion peso rescue package really uh, as allowed? Allow the, uh, I mean, really, how can it really help? Uh, are we just uh, uh, throw, uh, you know, let's be candid. Uh, the, the, the given the size of the of the uh, loss in terms of contraction in the GDP, is this uh, will this create any noticeable dent in that uh, area in, in in trying to 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 keep our or to help bring bring the economy back to its pre two thousand twenty levels. Those are the two issues, uh, Mr. Chairman, which I would like our resource persons to address in their statements this morning. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, uh, Senator Dillon, and uh, uh, thank you for the reminder. You uh, voiced this out uh, during the last hearing, and we expect from our uh, resource persons, especially from the DOF, Land Bank, and DBP, to uh, clearly explain how uh, this proposed measure uh, can address the uh, enormity of the uh, contraction in our uh, economy and uh, what are the steps to get there no, in terms of stimulating and 
uh, bringing our economy back. Uh, with that, uh, we'd like to hear from Senator Marcos. Any opening remarks? Um, I have no opening remarks. Like you said, this is the continuation of a previous hearing, and we'd like to hear uh, the explanation of both the line bank, the DBP, as well as our private, private sector um, to understand um, how the guide bill will actually help, given my concern at the time that um, um, the uh, borrowing rates have plummeted. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Senator Marcos, and in one of the uh, principal authors of this bill, uh, definitely you have a lot of uh, safeguards that you have placed in your uh, version, and you also try to uh, adopt some of those safeguards that you have uh, laid forth in your version. Um, so with that, uh, we will call on the Department of Finance or any of its agencies, attached agencies, to uh, respond to the query of our centers and also to uh, respond to the quiz from the previous hearing. Uh, we left over a lot of uh, hanging questions that we need to uh, um, uh, discuss thoroughly in this hearing. And uh, the aim of this hearing is to uh, cover all the loose ends so that we can uh, continue and pursue uh, a uh, technical working group to put uh, definite to, to uh, uh, finalize the uh, proposed measure. So we call on the Department of uh, Finance, uh, Treasurer Leah uh, De Leon. Honorable Senator Sherwin Cachalian, Senator Franklin Gilon, Senator Amy Marcos, and to all those present attending the second hearing on the guide bill. Good morning, Paul. Last year, when the pandemic plunged the entire world into one of the toughest health and economic crises, in recent history, it was clear that this challenge will not be short. Fortunately, we were prepared to fight a long battle, exercising prudence over the use of our fiscal resources. Throughout the fight against the COVID-19 pandemic, the government has been focused not just on saving lives from the virus, but also saving lives from hunger and other diseases. We ushered the early enactment of the Pioneer One law to fund the emergency subsidy program and small business wage subsidy allowing people to get through the restrictive lockdowns needed at the time. Soon after, Congress approved a fiscally responsible Bayanihan to recover as one act, or Bayanihan II, providing another round of fiscal measures to stimulate consumer demand and support businesses critically impacted by the pandemic. An effective recovery plan considers long-term fiscal soundness and administrative feasibility Moving from the stimulus bills of Bayanian 1 and 2, the Duterte administration's economic recovery program includes an additional three legislative measures, imperatives to secure a swift and sustainable economic recovery while addressing the needs of particular segments of the economy. Through CREATE, we responded to the need to boost after-tax corporate income, leading more funds for job creation and firm expansion. Through FIST, we responded to the need to get rid of the bad assets of banks in order to increase the capacity of these financial institutions to lend. The main purpose of GUIDE is to address the problem of temporary solvency, not liquidity. Because if a firm has a short-term cash problem, the solution is to borrow, and that's what Bayanihan 2 and FIST offer. There are some companies, however, that have temporary solvency problems, so borrowing will not solve the problem. But the company's need is equity infusion. This is addressed through the creation of a special holding company that will invest in strategically important companies by providing the capital infusion. Eventually, in the course of the deliberations in the House, not only did Guide provide funds to the special holding company, it also provided funds for MSMEs making it a two-in-one program, but the real focus is now on the special holding company. When businesses close, people lose jobs. When people lose their jobs, overall aggregate demand declines, further threatening the viability of businesses that remain. We reiterate that this is a vicious cycle that calls for urgent government intervention. The threat of a domino effect, especially the case of our strategically important companies, Six and their forward and backward linkages are closely linked to various segments of the economy. 
even as we roll out the COVID-19 vaccines and the prospect of further economic reopening comes to light, the cash flow issues that businesses faced over the past 12 months pose continued challenges to their solvency. This is why providing timely and effective assistance to MSMEs and SICs is crucial to ensuring a strong economic rebound. Guide by Design is not new because it is patterned after similar programs in the U.S. and Germany. The main difference is the amount of money because under the guide, only 10 billion pesos will be made available. Meanwhile, the German Economic Stabilization Fund, a 600 billion euros, the U.S. Troubled Asset Relief Program, spent $420 billion during the global financial crisis of 2008. The TARP program prevented the American automobile industry from failing and saved more than 1 million jobs, helped stabilize banks, and restored credit availability for individuals and businesses. On the other hand, the Economic Stabilization Fund was established in 2020 to reduce the damage caused by the COVID-19 pandemic to the German real economy. Our infusion of 10 billion pesos is small, but that is what the budget allows for now. Although this is the case, it is a good start. Given all this, the need to urgently enact guide roots from these three main reasons. First, there are strategic firms that we cannot afford to lose because they provide essential services such as transport and essential supplies. Second, there is a deep supply chain linkage between large firms and MSMEs. For instance, the supply chain of food manufacturers is really dependent on MSMEs. So if these firms fail, then MSMEs fail as well. Third, guide contributes to confidence building. This will allow us to act proactively as we move towards economic recovery. Similar to the fist bill, we proactively pushed for the fist up while our bank's asset quality is still relatively solid, learning from the experiences of the finance, Asian financial crisis. As part of the economic recovery program, the urgent approval and enactment of the guide bill will help accelerate economic recovery by protecting jobs, saving businesses, and boosting investor confidence. With your kind indulgence, Mr. Chairman, may I now turn over the presentation of, for the representatives of the Development Bank of the Philippines and the Land Bank of the Philippines to provide more details and answer and respond to the queries posed uh, by the good side of first. Good morning, um, members of the Senate. So, uh, I'm, I'm Francis Nicolas Chua. Of BDP, and I'm here to present the first part of our guide bill. And, um, Mr. Chua. Yes, sir. But, yes, uh, so on uh, the first portion of the guide bill, um, we'd like to discuss again. Uh, just the portion on the MSME support and financial assistance. Next slide, please. So as mentioned, on a year on year basis, employment dropped year basis by about two seven million. Well nominal GDP by about in twenty. So the change in nominal GDP is about 1.5 trillion. It's about 1.5 trillion. See in this of which would be in your manufacturing students, followed by transport and firms. We are trying to support um, through our MSME uh, financial assist assistance and as well as through the SICs later on to be discussed by my colleague in Landa. Next slide, please. So in the main features of GUIDE, we would again like to highlight uh, that in relation to MSME, uh, what we are trying to achieve in GUIDE is to lower the cost of your trying The exact way is to lower the villages to be provided to MSMEs. And, and there would be um, some form of lowering cost as these are lowering our costs, new cost, as these are costs usually borne by other. And as far as the credit programs are concerned, 
uh, the existing credit programs under Bayanihan 2 or Bayanihan would be the ones uh, that will be utilized and uh, that will be utilized um, SMEs. In relation to the special holding company, as mentioned, a uh, guide bill um, is looking to create that special holding company to support strategically important corporations experiencing temporary solvency issues. Next slide, please. Out of the um, capital infusion to be given to the GFIs, there has already been uh, more than uh, 39 or 40 billion provided under Bayanihan 2. And under Guide, we are looking to have an additional infusion of about 10 billion, 2.5 for DBP and 7.5 for Land Bank, for a total of 50 billion. As mentioned by Treasurer Leia uh, in the last hearing, this 50 billion was the original contemplation under uh, Bayanihan 2, um, but it was decided that uh, this portion uh, of the 10 billion for the SHG uh, be carved out um, as a separate measure. Be carved out um, as a separate measure. Next slide, please. So now to discuss the lowering borrowing costs for MSMEs, um, we can move to the next slide. So again, we are looking at the eligibility of MSMEs for both banks. Uh, while DBP is primarily focused on infrastructure, services, service industry, and manufacturing, and land bank is on the agribusiness value chain. So these are the MSME sectors that we are looking at uh, supporting for both the GFIs. Next slide. In terms of priority list, again, since we are looking at uh, the largest uh, contributor to the decline in employment uh, on the manufacturing and construction and transportation, so these are the three focus areas um, for us at this point, uh, manufacturing, construction, and transportation, and then followed by services sector. As we know, accommodation and food service activities has been in the decline due to our lockdowns. Um, but this is something that we are also trying to support. And we understand the support and we understand the transitioning. And we would need to support uh, this transition through uh, our various programs. programs. Slide, please. So uh, there was a question in the previous hearing on what the GFIs have already provided in relation to our MSA lending. So under the Bayanihan programs, um, as far as DBP is concerned and also as a land bank, we've already streamlined our process. Um, credit investigation would now be a pre-release requirement instead of pre-approval. Um, there is no collateral requirement for loans below 3 million pesos. Um, interest rate is currently fixed at the DBP side at 3% per annum, subject that uh, the business retains 100% of its employees. Uh, there is reduced turnaround time on other various requirements, and service fees are currently waived as well. So guide would augment uh, this, uh, this assistance already provided by the GFIs by providing additional capital to DBP and land back, which would again increase our ability to lend. And the main pro the main uh, item under guide for MSME is really the tax exemption and fee privileges to further lower the borrowing costs of the MSMEs. So this would be the exemption from BST, documentary stamp tax, capital gains tax, creditable withholding tax, value-added tax, gross receipts tax, and other taxes. Um, as mentioned, uh, just for the duration um, of this portion. Um, let me now turn over uh, the discussion on the special holding company to uh, my colleague in Land Bank, Ian. Thank you. Um, hello, good, uh, good morning to the good senators and to the others present in the virtual meeting right now. Um, so I am Gian. Uh, I'll be presenting on behalf of Land Bank of the Philippines on the creation of the special holding company, particularly on the quantitative benefits of the investment in the SHC. Um, next slide, please. 
So for this section of the presentation, I will be looking at three areas. Um, first would be, um, I will be uh, discussing the impact of COVID-19 on employment, uh, particularly on the SICs or strategically important corporations. Um, uh, sorry, that's letter B. Letter B would be um, the discussion of the forward and backward linkages of these SICs. So this would um, cover the companies that are suppliers to the SICs. Um, and this would also cover benefits um, that the users of the products of the SICs would uh, be able to achieve if we invest in these strategically important companies. And then um, thirdly, I will be discussing the potential returns that the SHC might probably be able to derive from its investment in strategically important companies companies. So now let me proceed with the first part of the presentation, first section of the presentation. So <clears throat> for, um, for the quantification of, ben of quant quantification of benefits, um, here are the major assumptions used. Uh, first, uh, we chose 15 strategically important companies in which to invest to. And then secondly, for data limitation purposes, um, we, among all the eligible uh, companies which could be considered strategic, we only chose from the pool of publicly listed companies, but um, in the final selection, uh, those private companies would also be part of the selection pool. Um, and then based on the selection that we made on the 15 SICs, these SICs are distributed um, into the following industries. That would be construction, water supply, sewerage, waste management, and re remediation activities, accommodation and food service activities, real estate activities, transportation and storage, as well as wholesale and retail trade. Um, next slide, please. So flashed on screen is the um, our assessment on the possible impact on employment. I would just like to highlight that the numbers flashed on screen are the direct impact on employment. Um, this would be the total number of employees that the 15 SICs would lose should these 15 SICs would fold up. So as of um, 2020, um, the total number of employees in these 15 SICs is about 119,000. Now, if, for example, um, they would lose 25% of the employees should um, they, uh, they contract because of the pandemic without equity infusion, then we're looking at a direct decline in employment of about 30,000. And if they would completely fold up, or stop operating, then the 119,000 would be um, retrenched. Now, um, these numbers here, as I've mentioned, are, are direct uh, declines in employment. But um, later on, as we will see, uh, these SICs have very strong forward and backward linkages. So if these companies would fold up, then those companies that are depending on these SICs might probably show some contraction in the in their employee level as well. So the next section of the presentation um, tackles the forward and backward linkages of the 15 uh, potential SICs. So just to give you a background thought, um, the backward linkages would uh, talk about the inputs that the SICs um, would consume from related industries. For forward linkages, this would entail the output of the SICs that would serve as inputs to related industries. So um, based on the table flashed on screen, the economic total economic linkages, um, meaning the sum of both forward and backward linkages for these 15 SICs, um, would range from 8.3 billion to 1.3 billion. And many of these linkages um, would cover MSMEs as well. So um, not helping SICs would definitely mean um, not helping MSMEs who are depending on these SICs for their business. Now, in terms of percent to 
total um, nominal GDP as of uh, 2020, um, we see here that uh, there are companies, there's a company in construction um, that accounts for about 5.18% of the nominal GDP of 2020. So that's how big the, this company's contribution is to the economy as of last year. Now for the um, forward linkages, um, the highest contribution here is um, the company in wholesale and retail, which accounts for 2.69% of um, nominal GDP as of 2020. Um, next slide, please. So if we sum up all the uh, forward and backward linkages and categorize them according to industry um, and total them up, the total linkages would be about 5.41 trillion. And so that would be the um, the maximum contribution to the economy, if ever. Um, and in terms of contribution to total nominal GDP, the contribution of these SICs in terms of backward linkages is quite significant at 18.95%. And then for forward linkages, it would be at 11.16%. So the next section of the presentation would now talk about the possible returns that the SHC might probably be able to uh, generate from investment in SICs. So in determining the amount of equity infusion to be given to the various um, SICs, there are certain um, criteria or rules that must be followed. The first one is that to avoid concentration risk, each the deployment to each industry should not exceed 20% of the funds of the SHC. Um, so if you look at this uh, table flashed on screen, um, all the, uh, the um, infusion to the industries would not be more than 25%. The highest industry, uh, the industry with the highest equity infusion would be transportation and storage, as well as wholesale and retail at 25% or 2.5 billion. Um, it is important to note that transportation and storage is one of the badly hit companies by the uh, badly hit industry by the COVID-19 pandemic, while wholesale and retail trade, this is one of the, this is the industry with the highest forward and backward linkage. Um, so next slide, please. So in order for us to assess the um, potential returns in investment to the strate to strategically important corporations, here are the assumptions that we we made. So um, in this particular table, um, we um, highlighted the potential um, equity infusion of the 15 SICs that we have uh, chosen. So the equity infusion into these SICs would range from about 500 million pesos to a billion pesos. Um, and uh, this follows the rule that no single SIC would have more than 10% of the SHC's funds. Now to come up with a return computation, we, um, we estimated certain um, dividend rates for uh, investment into this SHCs, particularly on the preferred shares. So it's at 5.45%, uh, uh, sorry, it would be at 7.5%. And then these returns were uh, discounted uh, to take into account time value of money. So to give you um, uh, more background on the structuring, um, investment into the SICs would come in the form of redeemable preferred shares with a call option in the fifth year. So in our assumption, um, we, uh, we assumed that uh, the holding period for the investment in SICs will be over a five-year period. So there would be uh, dividends that will be remitted to the SHC over that five-year period. And then on the fifth year, whatever principal or in equity infusion, whatever amount we infused as equity in this SICs will be returned back to the SHC. So with those um, working assumptions, let me now move on to the first scenario that we have. 
So under our first scenario, this is the optimistic scenario. So this assumes that all of the SICs will um, will recover, and um, together with the recovery, they will be able to pay us a 7.5% dividend over the five-year period. And on the fifth year, we'll be able to recover our um, equity investment. So if we work with those assumptions, then um, in terms of total cash flows, the SHC will be able to generate 13.75 billion pesos. Um, if we take into account uh, the time value of money or the cost of money, then that would amount to 10.96 billion pesos. And that would be compared with a 10 billion equity infusion for a return on investment of 9.63%. So if um, these SICs will be able to recover from the pandemic over the five-year period, then um, the SHC will be able to generate uh, a decent return from its investment. Um, on the next scenario, um, this second scenario that we have answers the question, how many SICs, what is the maximum number of SICs that would have to fail before the return of the special holding company would turn negative? So um, the answer to that question is that two of the SICs could fail um, before the special holding company would um, get negative returns on its investment. So for this particular um, scenario, we assumed that the two companies out of the 15 potential SICs, the two companies that are riskiest out of the 15 um, potential SICs would fail. And since um, they would fail, we assume that over the five-year period, we won't be receiving any dividends from them. And then at the end of the fifth year, um, the company will be liquidated and the SHC will just be able to recoup 50% of its initial investment. So if we take those assumptions, um, the SHC would still be able to achieve um, a positive return, although at a very small amount of 0.86% for um, total uh, value, um, taking into account the time value of money of 10.086 billion. So that would be compared to the 10 billion to achieve the zero, to compute the 0.86% ROI. Now, in terms of risk mitigation, um, the SHC, before it invests into the SICs, would review the soundness of the rehabilitation plan of the uh, potential SICs. So, and at the same time, um, there would be uh, monitoring involved to make sure that the companies would. Um, would act in accordance to the agreement um, and would act uh, aligned with the, uh, the initiatives they've mentioned in their recovery plan. And those uh, mitigants would hopefully reduce the likelihood of um, the SHC experiencing um, some negative returns on certain companies because of closure. Um, next slide, please. So that would be the um, end of the presentation for the quantitative benefits of um, investing in strategically important industries. Mr. Chair? Uh, yes, uh, is that Senator Marcos? Yes, that's right. Yeah, hi. Marcos, go ahead. Yes, um, if you would allow. I'm a little bit perplexed. Uh, by the presentation of both our treasurer as well as the uh, land bank, um, given that uh, there seem to be two conflicting and contradictory target groups. One is the SIC or the strategically important companies. Um, I am not certain that there are really micro transport or communication companies. Are there really small water supply companies? Um, which are these companies you are talking about? On the other hand, you speak of the MSMEs as the target beneficiaries. 
Um, you and I know that um, banks have consistently failed to allocate the 8% uh, loans um, required by law to MSMEs. So, alin ba talaga? I, SIC yung strategically important o yung MSME? Para magkahiwalay ito eh. Saka hindi naman sila magkakapareho. You also seem to already have the list of the 15 beneficiaries. So perhaps it would give us a better window to uh, understand this bill if you told us what are those 15 companies? Are they really MSMEs? No. No, they're not. <laughs> Kaya nga eh. No. Um. Um. Two F or Landa for DVP may respond to the question of Senator Ivy. Um, Senator Gachalian. Um, if I may, I would like to respond to the uh, question of uh, Senator Marcos. Um, good morning, po, Senator Marcos. So for the for your question po on who will benefit po from the guide bill, um both SMEs po and the um strategically important corporations would benefit from the guide bill. For MSMEs po, um, there are sorry ha, land bank. Yes. So ina admit mo na yung strategically important at saka MSME magkahiwala yun, magkaiba. Correct Hindi po, ma'am. Hindi natin pwedeng uh, ilump together na pare-pareho yan. Kasi magkaiba yan. Yes po, ma'am. na natin. Eh yes, kaso, po, yung 10 billion na yan, napakaliit dun sa strategically important. Eh napakalaki naman sa MSMEs. Asan ba tayo? Okay po, ma'am. So, for the, ano po, ma'am, for the uh, equity infusion na 10 billion, um, um, based on our discussion po with uh, DBP and with the DOF, um, we're seeing that this 10 billion will be um, diverted po to the SHC. Now, for lending to MSMEs po, we could use the funds from the Bayanihan 2 po, ma'am, to implement lending to MSMEs. Um, and in this particular guide bill po, the lending to MSMEs is enhanced further po by the tax exemptions that it carries. And these tax exemptions po, as mentioned by Nick earlier during his presentation, would reduce po the cost of lending to MSMEs. And in fact, as mentioned by Nick earlier, we have programs in Land Bank and DBP that would provide very preferential rates po to MSMEs at just 3%. That's way below market rates po, given the risk profile of these MSMEs. Now, for the SICs po, ma'am, um, SICs uh, by nature... Um, should be to generally be large companies because they are chosen based on um, the amount of employees that they have um, and their the degree of their forward and backward linkages. So essentially, these SICs would be large corporations. Well, but even if they are large corporations, helping them would also be would also translate to help to MSMEs because many of the uh, companies that. Um, these SICs deal with are also MSMEs po. Yes, so, understood. Some, Pero yes, yung 10 billion, right. kasi ang mahalaga dito, di ba, yung 10 billion na bago, yun yung bago. Yung 10 yes, billion na yun, babagsak sa special holding company which will only assist the strategically important companies. Yung MSMEs, wag na natin guluhin, walang additional 10 billion for MSMEs. Di ba? Yes. Um, on that yun one, po, so, Yes, uh, yes, po, Senator As usual lang, the usual portfolio, kaya lang may tax exemption, may kung ano-anong uh, added Philip. But in fact, uh, there's no additional uh, money for MSMEs. Etc. The entire 10 billion is going to the so-called strategically important companies, which are more or less very large operations. Correct po, ma uh, Treasurer. Uh, correct po, uh, Senator Marcos. Um, if I may add po, Senator Marcos, um, in our discussion with the DOF and DDP, um, while we are in the process of setting up this SHC po, and while this amount has not yet been infused into the SHC, this could be temporarily used po for lending to MSMEs. Uh, so that is the... Teka, uh, naguluhan ako. Yung 10 billion... 
pwedeng ipahiram sa MSME. Akala ko it's already Wha stuck with the special holding company. Um, while it's not been, while it's not yet infused po to the SHC. So the intention really for the 10 billion po is to infuse it into the SHC. Um, but um, during the process, po, while it has not yet been infused to the SHC, um, it will be used for the meantime for MSME lending. Po. Sigurado ka? Hindi ba magulo yun? Palipat-lipat siya? Um, eh, kasi magiging uh, CEO, CC na nga yung isa eh. Tapos hihugutin mo yung pera doon, bibigay mo sa MSME in the general loan portfolio. Kaya ang gulo. Yeah, Senator, Senator Ayemi Marcos, this is Alea po. Tama po kayo. Um, actually, sir, ma'am, uh, hindi naman lang po talaga ipapahiram sa MSMP po yung 10 billion because if you will recall, malaki na po inabigay na nga po natin under Bayanihan 2 sa DPP. Yes, I understand. Uh -oh. So, talaga po, ang, ang dinagdag ang additionality po lang ng guide bill as far as MSMP ay yung pong hinihingi na tax exemption and fee privileges para po maibaba ang cost of borrowing ng ating mga MSMPs. Pero yung um, ma'am, we can um, go with you na talaga let's just focus on the special holding company. Pwede ba pwede kiwalay na lang yan para maliwanag? Kasi kung ako nahihilo na tapos meron pang hugot-hugot dito kapag uh, hindi pa nabubuo yung uh, SHC, eh, liwanagin na natin para maayos ang himay. I uh, see the minority uh, leader and I see the floor to him. I agree po ma'am. Yes, we recognize the good minority floor leader, Senator Dillon. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman, um, and thank you, Senator Marcus. Um, the, the equity infusion into the special holding company is $10 billion. Uh, that's, that's clear now. Um, the 9.5% drop in the GDP is equal to 1.5 trillion pesos. Are we convinced that this, that first, are we convinced that uh, putting up the special holding company to assist uh, the 15 critically, uh, uh, critical, uh, SIC, uh, critical SICs, critical SICs. Strategically, Opa. Oh, Will that make a dent? Uh, all right, uh, because really, I, I, you know, given all of this, I raise questions on the sincerity of the administration in helping our strategically important companies. Remember in the United States, President Biden just signed a $1.9 trillion rescue package. Of course, uh, that's what I, uh, I'm citing that uh, to show how serious the United States in helping and putting back the economy on its feet through this direct uh, assistance. In our case, as admitted by the National Treasurer, 10 billion is such a small amount, and I do not know whether this can help. And especially, you know, I raised the issue of the uh, of, of, of the uh, priorities. We have 19 and a half billion in anti-insurgency fund. We have 10 billion to assist 15 uh, strategically uh, important companies. Where is our priorities? I repeat, 10 billion is being infused into this uh, special uh, holding company to assist the large employers who, if we do not assist, give assistance, may result in a, re in a retrenchment of about 30,000 workers. But given the size of the contraction of our economy, now among the worst in the world, 9.5% of GDP, which is about 1.5 trillion pesos, I, I, I am tempted to say, and I'm saying it, that 10 billion as a rescue package is a joke, especially if you look at it in the context of a 19.5 billion anti-insurgency fund, which is actually a pork barrel. So, Mr. Chairman, I am convinced that we need uh, this rescue package. But is 10, million, 10 billion a serious package? 
given the magnitudes that we're talking about? Mr. Mr. Chairman, if I may uh, respond to the Honorable Senator. So, Senator Gillo, uh, of course, uh, right now, 10 billion po, because as you know, that is what uh, right now our fiscal position could afford. But as we have also shown in the presentation, yung pong 10 billion, if you would also look at it from the vantage point po ng yung pong the upstream and the downstream uh, linkages, it would also redound to about a quarter of our GDP, yung pong 5 trillion or 21 trillion expected um, GDP for 2021. So yung pong mas kahit po ganun ka small lang ang um, um, amount that you are providing for these SICs, even po yung kanilang importance in the economy, ay malaki po ang kanilang magiging resulta if we will not also assist these companies. That's correct. If we are going to assist, and I think we should assist, we should provide more assistance, provided there are safeguards. Wag naman yung sampung billion lang. We should assist our companies more because they are the generators of our economy. They are the ones who provide the employment. I would repeat, 10 billion is just one half of the anti-insurgency fund of 19 and a half billion, which has already been appropriated, and which to me is a pork barrel, uh, because you participate in, or because uh, it falls under the definition that you identify the projects after the funds are appropriated. Uh, and yet here we are uh, trying to scrape the bottom with a 10 billion fund for uh, strategically important companies for an investment through the special holding company. And, you know, I am sure in your heart of hearts, you do not feel that this is adequate. It does not make a dent. If we are going to go for it and assist really our companies, let's go for a larger amount. And I have confidence in the professionalism of Land Bank and uh, uh, DBP, in the professionalism, uh, in the professional uh, uh, per component of these two financial institutions to be able to make sure that uh, these funds are utilized properly uh, in order to assist our economic recovery. But 10 billion is nothing. And I repeat that, 10 billion is nothing. It is a drop in the bucket if you look at the 1.5 trillion loss in the economy as a result of the pandemic. So I would ask Mr. Chairman, Either we add more funds or we scrap this program because it does not, it does not uh, help us. I would favor that we increase the uh, amount of money that we can lend to strategically important corporations rather than uh, allocate our funds in such uh, uh, activities as anti-insurgency run by politicians. I would rather have more uh, of the 10 billion run by the professionals in our GFIs rather than uh, 19 billion run uh, utilized by uh, politicians and, uh, and, mili and former military officials. Mr. Chairman, yes. Yes. Uh, first of all, uh, we'd like to thank uh, Senator G. Lon, uh for your remarks. Um, also, just again to reiterate, we're putting for the 10 billion as a demonstration effect Kasi ako, um, even as you have also mentioned, the competence and the professionalism of Land Bank and DBP, we will make sure po na there would, uh, we would be successful in resuscitating these companies. There would be adequate safeguards. We would make sure that uh, taxpayers' money are adequately protected. Uh, but at the same time po, with this kind of uh, structure, we are also already started talking with some of our multilaterals, particularly their private sector um, departments, also to infuse later on uh, additional capital into the special holding company. So, yeah, I'm very sure debate on that, Leah. What we are debating on is the sufficiency of the 10 billion. If we are really sincere in trying to help our strategically important companies or the SICs through the uh, special holding company, if we are really sincere that we should prioritize this, 10 billion, I repeat, is a drop in the bucket. I am not forward and forward linkages 
that we are citing. I have no doubt about that. But the very limitation is the very grossly inadequate funds being appropriated for the SHC. This, this, this is very important and taken in the context of where we are today. Yes, this could be the right way of, uh, of propping up, of, I'm sorry, of reviving our economy. But we cannot revive the economy with 10 billion pesos, but at the same time putting 19 and a half billion in a pork barrel anti-insurgency fund. That's what, that's what concerns me. That's the, the priorities that we have. Uh, insofar as our effort to revive our economy is concerned. I have no debate with you on this. What I am debating with you, Leah, is, Madam National Treasurer, is the adequacy of the 10 billion pesos as a rescue package. Is there a chance that we, incre can, we can increase this? As a National Treasurer? Can you... Can First, what would you think that increasing this would do our economy better? Of course, Mr. Senator, um, as I've said po in my remarks, right now, po, um, based on our affordability, our fiscal position, nakita lang po namin, 10 billion is what we can count out at the moment. But, sir, um, remember po, we also provided capital to um, Land Bank and TBP, and given their very... Um, Good, excellent performance in terms of their uh, um, of their performance in 2020, in spite of the pandemic. But lucky din naman po yung retained earnings nila, and we are also waiving their dividends. So they can assuming po na the, we have a good start on the SHC, then eventually they can also put more uh dun po sa KGSC as their contribution. Yeah. Kasi po, we are also waiving our um, yung kanilang declaration of dividends and uh, they still have po, uh, adequate uh, capital against yes. their um, yes. assets. Well, but the, 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 the prudence would dictate that the land bank would take uh, the uh, uh, would be very conscious of their fiduciary obligations when they dig into the uh, uh, onto the capital uh, of, of, the, of, the, of the bank. That is why I'm saying that uh, we should appropriate more from the national budget uh, for uh, the, uh, for the uh, special holding company because if you are saying that this is the key to assist our strategically important companies, we should put more funds from the national budget, not from the funds of the land bank or the EBP because it can cause difficulties to their financial position. Remember that there is a risk involved here. Since, since there is, it's entirely possible that uh, we cannot recover these monies because for what, you know, no one, no, nothing is certain, but we need to infuse, infuse funds in order to make the, econo the, the economic activity uh, in order to allow a continued economic activity of the strategic important companies. So that what I'm saying is the national government should put in more funds to be managed by this holding company uh, with uh, manned by professionals from the land bank and the BBP in order to make a dent and allow our strategically important companies and be assisted to recover 10 billion it's nothing if we are looking at the magnitudes of the losses in our economy. I would repeat, America, this, uh, President Biden just signed a $1.9 trillion rescue package. So uh, isn't, that, isn't this something to think about? Shouldn't we invest in this strategically, uh, in this uh, special holding company to assist our, our SICs through the professional competence of land bank and the DBP from the funds of the national government instead of prioritizing certain activities which cannot help our economy. As national treasurer, can you not add, can you not allocate more funds? Sir said that part the power of the purse is with the Congress with only fund uh, whatever is in the budget. Come on. We can appropriate funds so long as you cert issue a certification that funds are available. Go to the Congress. Come on. We know how these things go. Unless you certify that 
funds are available, we cannot appropriate funds because this is not a general budget. Um, in that, kaya we're, what we're proposing, uh, Mr. Senator, is right now, the way we look at it on, in terms of our fiscal space, we have the 10 billion. But uh, as we move along throughout the year, if they're able to generate yung excess income, then of course we can issue that certification and if we're able to locate more uh, financing that would be available, then we can always make that certification either for this uh, contribution to the SHC or for other priority um, expenditure programs of the national government as <laughs> of course approved by all of appropriated by Congress. Anyway, uh, Mr. Chairman, I have made my point I hope that the uh, that the subcommittee in its uh, report can take into account what we have mentioned as the inadequacy of the 10 billion pesos and uh, and, and we can review how the uh, how how the, uh, the the structure the safeguards uh, uh, on the uh, finances of uh, the land bank and the DBP but I have made my point that indeed the 10 billion is a drop in the bucket and I question the priorities of this government uh, in so far as allocating funds are concerned. We see the need for assistance to, uh, to our uh, the companies who generate the economic activity that we are uh, looking for. Uh, the companies which can save the employment of our people, and yet we allocate only one half to this uh, uh, to this uh, SHC compared to the anti-insurgency fund. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair, and we are submitting those comments for the committee's consideration in drafting the committee report. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you very much, sir, sir, for those very important points. And uh, indeed, if you uh, compare the 10 billion to the uh, 1.5 trillion loss, uh, that's really, um, can't even compare it no? because it's uh, really minuscule. Uh, I would like to pursue the point of uh, the good minority floor. Uh, earlier, you mentioned that uh, you've identified 15. Uh, I see, and the uh, the fifteen eight SICs uh, employ about one hundred ninety thousand people or employees. That would be correct, sir. They also produce about five point four trillion in terms of forward and backward linkages, meaning the value that they produce because of their size, about five point. Uh, Four trillion. Yes, but sir. Again, going by what uh, uh, the good minority floor mentioned earlier, this is only the fifteen companies that you have identified. But what is the universe of SICs that you think are in peril because of COVID nineteen? Yes, of the of the universe of SICs that you have identified, that you have categorized as in danger. Okay po, sir. Um, so to answer your question po, Senator Gatchelian, um, currently we're looking at potentially 1,250 po na mga SICs, potential SICs. So these 1,250 potential SICs, um, some of them are public companies po and some of them are privately held companies. Um, so the 1,250 uh, companies that might probably avail of the infusion um, would be 25, about 25% of the total number of large corporations in the country, which is estimated at more than 5,000. So this 1,250 potential SICs are SICs that are in trouble. Are yes, experiencing solvency issues. Yes, po, Senator. That would be the estimate. Po. And uh, this 1,250, how many employees do they have? And what forward and backward linkages in terms of value do they generate? 
going by your presentation, I want to put this as simple as possible so the appreciation is uh, easier. Uh, for the for the ano po, senator, I'm just doing some computations po. So for the um for the total number of employees of these one thousand two hundred fifty uh, potential SICs, um, we're pro potentially looking at six point three um, million employees po. About six point three million employees. Po. In terms of uh, value linkages, um, in terms of linkages, po, Senator, I don't have the information right now, po, on the linkages. So what we're saying is, if we do not uh, provide assistance to this one thousand two hundred fifty employees, six point three million. Uh, 1,250 potential SICs, 6.3 million jobs uh, can be lost. Yes, po. Um, that would be right, po, Senator. The 6.3 million jobs would be the estimate po, of the um, employees hired by these 1,250 SICs. Po. Uh, before I call uh, the DBT, I just want to finish this uh, question. In terms of uh, assistance, how much do we need uh, for this 1,250 uh, SICs? Um, on that one, po, Senator, um, I don't have the numbers right now, but we could perhaps extrapolate. Po. So if, for example, we invest po, 500 million in each of these 1,250 um, potential SICs, then that would be that would amount po, to 625 billion pesos. Po. So you will need 625, roughly, billion pesos. Yes, po. Yes, po. Save 6.3 million employees. Yes, po. Um, that would assume a 500 million po equity infusion to each of the 1,250 SICs, po. potential SICs. Please submit to us nila a definite computation of those because that's in line with uh, the query of Senator Delon and his uh, manifestation earlier that, oh, well, I do agree, no? 10 million is a small amount compared to the magnitude of the contraction. But it's also a small amount compared to the 625 billion estimated uh, equity infusion needed. So with that, uh, we'd like to uh, just submit to us a, a, a uh, breakdown of that uh, 1,250 SICs, just to give us a universe. And um, we would like to also request from the DOF uh, to look into the possibility of increasing that 10 billion. Uh, because what we want is impact. If you're saying we also want confidence, a greater amount will result to a greater uh, will result to greater confidence. So uh, we'd like to also request pressure Leah to look into that possibility. Uh, we now recognize DPP. Sir? Uh, we recognize DPP. The, uh, someone was raising your hand. Uh, magandang umaga po. Your Honor, uh, Chairman uh, Senator Wynn, this is Manny Herbosa of uh, DBP. I'd like to pick up from what you said about impact and also uh, in pursuit of what uh, Senator Grillon had said about the 10 billion as being a uh, drop in the bucket. But if we're going to focus among the SICs, if I were to, to suggest, it's really the transportation that's really become very, very critical to this economic stimulus. For as long as many employees can't get to their workplaces because there's hardly transportation, because there's hardly transportation, I think that's a very, very critical consideration that we have to put in. And uh, I've been saying since the third quarter of last year, that uh, we have to intelligently and rationally lift up transportation. 
Kasi wala, marami po nga ako na, na, naririnigo dyan eh. May trabaho po, pero they had to give it up because they can't go to their places of work. And that's to me, is a tragedy. And uh, uh, just about two days ago, I had a conference with an organization uh, composed of the uh, bus operators. They're also in danger of folding up because they're way below their break-even uh, uh, point, no? In, in, in operating profitably and sustainability. So that really worries, worries me. DBP has been supporting the PUB, Public uh, Utility Modernization Program, so that we will have uh, financial inclusion by enabling the operators to invest in the companies with minimal equity, but a lot of funding support from both Land Bank and, and DBP. But that also will be imperiled because, you know, there's, we have to observe what uh, social distancing. Of course, you know, uh, abiding strictly by health protocol. But, but I think we really need more risk managers to focus on transportation. I'm worried about that. You know, for example, I, I, I've heard the discussion that the provincial buses are not allowed to operate because they're supposed to be carriers of the virus. But I really think that those companies are professionally managed enough to be able to manage health protocols and instill personal hygiene. You know what's happened, sir? An un un unintended consequence. Uh, let's say talking about the South where I live, in the bedroom communities of Santa Rosa and San Pedro, there is now a proliferation of, uh, of colorum. Uh, PUVs, and they're scalping the employees who want to come to office. Well, set aside the price because supply and demand po yan, huh? But what I'm saying, those many, many UVs are themselves really the germ carriers because those are not safe bubbles. They offer rides. So these are the, these are the real infection carriers rather than... Uh, provincial buses or jeeps that the government can really control. So for me, transportation po is the focus. Uh, and I'd like to uh, thank uh, Senator Drillon for forcing us uh, to, to focus in, in DBP po, yung mga aming mga financial inclusion outreach so far in helping uh, the economy sustain itself. It, we, we can't be all over the place, but I'm after proof of concept, successful proof of concept for the rice, for the corn, even at BARM, where uh, we're funding, uh, let's say, productivity projects like providing solar, solar technology in their farms. But I can't be all over the Philippines. So we've got to focus, sir. And I'd like to thank Senator Drillon for that uh, direction. And uh, Chairman, I, I, I really appreciate your work, your word on impact. We need impact. So the 10 billion should not be spread out all over this SICs. If I were going to make the choice, I'll concentrate on transportation, but I need help from this government to lift it up rationally. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Well, DBP being a part of the SHC, We'll have a stronger voice on how you will allocate the funds. No? Um, but uh, I do agree with you, sir, that transportation is a very important component. No? And uh, 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 attached to transportation is also logistics, which is a very important uh, factor right now because of the pandemic. No? A lot of things are being sold and bought over the Internet. So uh, we'll, go, we'll, we'll discuss that later on. Um, uh, and go into detail, but I have some questions to uh, to the DOF, to our treasurer, uh, Leah, and these are just some things on my mind, no, that I want to put on record. Uh, treasurer Leah, to mitigate risk, no, and uh, of course, if we can broaden the ownership uh, by inviting uh, the multilaterals at the beginning, no it will reduce the risk and enhance the check and balance of the uh, HSC, the SHC. Uh, 
it's, uh, I would like to ask, why not invite them at the beginning, no, during the incorporation stage? Uh, in fact, uh, throughout the bill, there's an intention of bringing them in anyways. No? Why not invite them in, in the beginning, uh, broaden the ownership? By broadening the ownership, we reduce the risk. Uh, and at the same time, we improve governance at the board level. So why not in invite them at the beginning uh, in the incorporation stage? Of course, uh, that's a very good suggestion, uh, Your Honor. Um, uh, right now, uh, we are already have we have initiated talks, and we have also um, already uh, laid uh, um, provided them with the background. But of course, uh, Senator Kachalian, um, we also need um, the enabling environment, the legislation, so, as a, because we have given them the momentum proof of concept, which also of course they would have to sell to their own boards and their own uh, respective uh, taxpayers. But uh, we will look into that, po, and, and in fact, we have already started discussions with them. But uh, in our discussions, they are also looking for more information, particularly po, in terms of uh, what could be the legal basis for us to be able to establish the special voting company. Uh, how is the likelihood of uh, the multilaterals joining at the incorporation stage based on your conversation with them? Um. Sir, uh, we will have to look for into the timeline because they also have their own processes, um, uh, including going to their boards. And of course, they would also have to be preparing their own legal documentation. Um, but this early, po, uh, given your suggestion, we will already also uh, uh, discuss with them about the prospect and of course, uh, including um, the, um, the pipeline of SICs that we have also already identified. Uh, so just uh, they also have to do their own due diligence, uh, just like any other uh, investor. Another, another, uh, cons another issue that uh, has been uh, going around my mind is the uh, issue of uh, conflict of interest. And I'm just asking this to play devil's advocate. Uh, of course, when we incorporate the S SHC, the holding company, uh, it will be given a lot of powers and leeway to invest. No, um, e even though uh, we trust the capability and the uh, impartiality of uh, land bank and the BP in terms of governance, how do we dispel uh, perception of potential conflict of interest? potential favoring certain industries, favoring certain companies. How do we dispel that uh, in, this, uh, in, in this concept? Um, Mr. Chairman, uh, there are already um, in the law, and also we should really, uh, uh, and details more granular details will also be provided in the implementing rules and regulations. And of course, uh, even in the... Um, business operations po ng SHC in terms of the eligibilities. Um, for one, yung po res uh, restriction that they should not have any pending case already, that's already a uh, very restrictive uh, uh, provision uh, or requirement. And second po, uh, we are also saying na uh, dapat po uh, they should not be getting um, yung increase in their salaries ng mga mga directors nila, and of course, uh, we would really also be uh, looking into the governance aspect of the corporation, including uh, yung pong affiliation sila related parties. Uh, so, we make sure na it would not really, there would really be a very objective um, uh, discernment in terms of uh, their eligibility to be uh, for land back and DPP to be uh, investing in these companies. And of course, uh, Mr. Chairman, again, Nandun po ang presence po ng Congress oh, with, uh, with the Oversight Committee and there would be regular reporting to you. So that alone would uh, already um, make sure that Land Bank and DBP would really be doing their utmost um, um, careful uh, due diligence to ensure that there's uh, impartiality and uh, there won't be anything of um, doubt about uh, their equity infusion in these companies. Uh Treasurer, are you open to putting more transparency mechanisms here? Like, for example, regular publishing of reports, regular uh, disclosures, 
uh, the holding company is not publicly traded, no? although there's oversight, but uh, it's largely still uh, private in nature, no? even though public funds will be used. Uh, uh, what we suggest is to put more transparency mechanism so that uh, uh, the public will be enlightened and analysts uh, all over the country can uh, analyze and can join in the uh, uh, the uh, analysis of the special holding company. Uh, we welcome that suggestion, Mr. Chair. In fact, um, that would also add more attraction uh, to the participation of the multilaterals because they would then see that adequate safeguards and uh, we have uh, good governance embedded for those uh, business uh, operations for the special holding company. And of course, uh, we can also take uh, you know uh, examples of these best practices in the other structures uh, that were already uh, implemented in other jurisdictions. Treasure on a separate note, no, and and, and this is also another question as, that has been lingering in my mind. Um, this is primarily a job preservation mechanism, uh, and from the presentation earlier. Uh, the, the, the overarching goal is to preserve jobs uh, so that we don't displace workers and they preserve their um, security of tenure. And once the economy recovers, they're there you know, to jumpstart their companies. Um, if that being the case, uh, the capital that will be plowed into these uh, companies uh, might be used for other things. You know? Uh, because we're not, of course, only the businessmen will know how to operate their businesses. Um, just looking at the law, although there's a mention of job preservation, uh, we might run into a scenario where in capital that we have plowed in will be used to for other things, no? um, pay off other non-essential suppliers, pay off some other um, uh, expenses. And uh, how do we assure that the goal of preserving jobs will be the primordial goal of this of this uh, measure? Mr. Chairman, then uh, the draft legislation, we have placed there uh, some conditionalities, including the preservation of jobs. So in the agreement between the SHC and the, and the company, we will spell out that they should not be in terms of uh, layoffs. Um, it should be uh, within the consent of the SHC and as much as possible um, in the recovery plan, it would already uh, be the one, the um, overarching uh, objective is really to preserve the labor, uh, the staff that they have right now. Uh, that's why we are helping them uh, to be able to make sure now will try to minimize going layoffs. And at the same time, the part of the equity inclusion will also be geared towards uh, allocating uh, programs to ensure that the, the staff will be retained. Your retention. Would be one of the benchmarks for monitoring by the SHC. So we can uh, strengthen that language in the IRR or uh, of course in the implementing uh, regulations for that SHC. Yeah, the, because just to share with the panel, in that 1.9 trillion recovery or stimulus program by the states, by the U.S., a big chunk of that will go to their PPP program, the Paycheck Protection Program. And it's been uh, quite successful. I've been reading a lot of uh, analysis on that. And uh, that's why I personally, I do support the overarching goal of this bill to preserve jobs. And event, that is what we want, right? because when we preserve jobs, we preserve demand. Um, but uh, in the language of the bill, even though it's specified there that we cannot uh, retrench or lay off, uh, we, just, we need to strengthen the use of the funds. Uh, and the use of the funds should primarily go to, the, to, to job preservation and job retention. And that's... Uh, uh, what we suggest to incorporate in the bill to strengthen its goal that this bill is geared towards preserving uh, employment. Um, with that, uh, Treasurer, uh, we'll 
called on because we have a lot of uh, private sector representatives here. Uh, I have some more questions for uh, DOF, Land Bank, and DBT, but we'll, we'll go back to you uh, later on. We'll call on uh, some of our private sector representatives uh, who are here so they can uh, uh, weigh in on their... Uh, Weigh in on the uh, measure that we are uh, discussing on the hand. So, um, so we call on uh, first Phoenix, represented by uh, Mr. Rioni Sasoiko. Yes. Um Good morning, uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, Senator Gachalian. Uh, thank you very much for uh, inviting me here. Um, I'm here representing Phoenix. I'm a Ronnie Shiasoiko, a member of uh, Phoenix's uh, National Affairs Committee. And I have uh, prepared a very short uh, statement, opening statement. <clears throat> we laud the signing into law, uh, the passing and signing into law of the CREATE and the FIST bills, uh, which is now the FIST uh, CREATE Acts. These two measures are important elements of economic relief plan of the government to address the effects of COVID-19 pandemic and to increase the attractiveness of the Philippines to foreign investments. As the country anticipates the vaccination program to be rolled out by the government together with the private sector, we see the need for further measures that will help jumpstart the economy and help businesses navigate through further challenges that lies ahead. The Government Financial Institution's Unified Initiatives to Distressed Enterprises for Economic Recovery Bill, or GUIDE, is pending in Congress um, and is envisioned to provide financial assistance to distressed enterprises critical to economic recovery by addressing liquidity problems of medium, small, and micro enterprises, and strategically important industries, such as those in the agriculture supply chain, food industry, manufacturing, low cost and socialized housing, hospitality, and education, among others. This will be done through the strengthening of the Philippine Guarantee Corporation, the infusion of fresh capital into the Land Bank of the Philippines and the Development Bank of the Philippines. The guide bill, also aims to rehabilitate strategically important companies that have adversely affected that have been adversely affected by the pandemic through the investments by a special holding company to be called uh, to be organized by land bank and dbp and to be known as rice this proposed law also gives further incentives and exemptions um, and privileges in the lending and investing activities of pgc LBP and DBP. The monetary authorities have taken unprecedented steps to ensure the availability of ample liquidity in the system to support economic activity. Advances have also been provided to help augment the national government resources in mitigating the impact of the pandemic in, and in the recent meeting of the policymaking monetary board of, at the Banco Central ng Pilipinas, it announced that it is maintaining its policy rate, rates at current low levels and left the previously reduced bank reserve requirements unchanged with the backdrop of rising prices arising from tight food supply and higher crude prices in the global market, resulting in a two-year peak inflation of 4.2%. The fiscal measures previously given under Bayanihan 1 and Bayanihan 2, targeted towards the demand side, would be would need to be further supported by putting in needed economic assistance into the supply side of the economy. The immediate passage of the guide bill would optimize the benefits of CREATE and FIST, help address the ongoing struggles of SMEs hard hit by the economic effects of COVID-19 pandemic, and would also help to balance the risks to inflation as the government pushes its efforts to pump prime the economy restore normalcy in the country's business sector, reduce unemployment, and provide renewed impetus towards robust economic growth. Thus, we at Phoenix strongly urge the immediate passage of the guide bill 
intended to give further assistance to marginalized industries heavily affected by the pandemic. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Mr. Ronnie, and uh, ang ganda ng painting niyo sa likod. <laughs> <laughs> ano po yan? Uh, matagal ng pinag pinag-ipunan. <laughs> ganda yan, ha? But uh, thank you for your comment, uh, uh, Mr. Uh, Ronnie. Uh, we got now yes. on the uh, Supply Chain uh, Management Association of the Philippines, Mr. Uh, uh, Pierre Kurai. Yes, thank you, um, Senator Wynn. Um, I'm Pierre Carlo Kurai from uh, Supply Chain Management Association of the Philippines. Uh, and first and foremost, uh, I'm honored to be uh, invited um, to this uh, discussion. Yes, uh, Upon listening to all of the comments, um, I understand the logic of of looking at in, um, supporting the the large corporations like the SICs um, because they have big value uh, supply chains, like uh, big value chain supply chains in their network. And um, my only concern is that, uh, like what like what Senator Amy said earlier, that. This this type of uh, investment uh, into these large corporations is uh, hopefully there, there's going to be safeguards that can ensure the trickle down effect of the of the investment into the different supply chains in MS, MSME. Coming from the supply chain sector, uh, we understand um, uh, the, the association is actually comprised of mostly multinationals. Uh, our, our board members are mostly. Um, from from FM, from FMCGs like uh, Nestle, Unilever, Procter and Gamble, and these and and, and we understand clearly the the, the mass effect uh, of these large corporations uh, to all of the different M, uh, SMEs, both suppliers, service providers, um, etc. So I, I I totally agree. Uh, there's a need for it. Um, and I, but I also totally agree. But uh, for supporting these large supply chains. Uh, 10 billion might not be enough, um, and 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 I fully support also the 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 comment of DBP um, uh, on the the, the 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 focus on logistics and transport. Um, the, the the not not because I'm from supply chain. That's why I'm saying that is because it's really um, supply chain and transport is actually encompassing. It 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 goes it it um it affects different types of industries. May it be manufacturing, may it be tourism, may it be people transport, um, and uh, an investment in that uh in a support in that will actually affect not only one industry but all other encompassing industries among among different among the industries logistics and supply chain and transport affects all. So, so in 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 that's the, that's the that's the actually the, the the beauty of supply chain. So I think that's that's basically uh, our our comment. Um, uh, that's basically uh, my idea on this one. And and uh, we laud uh, um, the government for having this. Uh, and we understand that this this uh, type of bills will help us bounce back in our economy. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you, sir. Uh, we also would like to hear from the Air Carriers Association of the Philippines, Attorney uh, Roberto Lin. Mr. Lim, we... Good, good morning, Chairman, uh, Senator Gachelia. Yeah, thank you for giving us the opportunity to participate in this hearing. To participate in this hearing, uh, we in clarifying the bill so that there is focus uh, as to the application of the fund and the source of the funding. We also welcome the ten billion. Uh, is really a small amount if in the, in the, not only in the context of the 
reduction in the economy but also in the context of the transportation in which at this point in time if i was to make a general quantification have only received about 800 million in terms of benefit under the Bayanian 2 in terms of uh, waiver of navigational fees when we compare ourselves with our neighbors in, uh, in asia in europe and the us uh, the the governments have provided a lot more or uh, cash support loans and guarantees early on so it is really uh, for the Philippine aviation sector, they have been left alone to survive and have been able to do so due to the dedication of their respective management and the dedication of their owners. No? Uh, I think foremost here is the effort of uh, each of these airlines to preserve jobs. But uh, given the fact that they have been left alone, really, uh, it has been unavoidable to extend further the employment of all, their, all of their employees. As of now, about 33% of their employees have, have been terminated. That's about 5,000 employees. We know that aviation is a catalyst of economic development, uh, providing about 3% of GDP in terms of support and uh, further increasing its contribution to the GDP if you were to add the so-called forward and backward linkages for tourism alone, which contributes 12% 12 per, 12 of GDP uh, and which has suffered an 84% decrease in tourism, uh, the adverse impact on their balance sheet is, is clearly evident. We also see that the aviation sector is a natural resource. We should not focus only on the impact now, which is evident, but to look at how it will recover in the future to continue uh, delivering its public service uh, obligations and missions for the islands, because we are an archipelagic nation, uh, providing connectivity for trade and commerce, and but also to consider the recovery of the aviation sector to meaningfully participate in international aviation. During these times of crisis, we have seen how Local carriers brought back uh, the Filipino OFWs that were stranded no, in foreign countries. Without a national aviation industry, uh, that would have posed greater problems for, for our country and for our Kababayans. Uh, we continue to suffer from uh, difficult uh, operating conditions uh, for last year. The estimated loss of the industry is about 65 billion pesos. Uh, with the recent surge, there are again additional restrictions, even in terms of passenger arrivals to the Philippines, uh, which is not really uh, related to the capacity of the airlines to serve and to continue transporting passengers, but really related, related, related more to the limitation of the accommodations in, in Metro Manila. So the solution really is to provide more accommodations because we are now, we are now requiring uh, a quarantine of five days, which use, uh, uses up the accommodation space. So the solution there is accommodation, not cutting down uh, airline capacity artificially. Uh, earlier, there was a distinction being made about solvency and liquidity. Uh, continue to encounter liquidity problems. It's been able to do so uh, on an ad hoc basis and of course cutting its workforce. We would hope and urge the Senate, senators and the executive branch of government to intervene in terms of loan guarantees which is the easiest way to address the liquidity issue, and which is still a relevant item under this bill. Because we are talking here of survival. Uh, we know that this law will take at least four months, five months, or six months to come into fruition and to be implemented for implementing rules and guidelines to be rolled out. And six months is more, what, three times of a lifetime. 
that the airlines will again have to face. No? Uh, so really, liquidity, to say that liquidity is a matter of just borrowing, is really, really a very difficult proposition for the airlines to face. Uh, so we would hope that this liquidity issue is also helped by this bill. Uh, in terms of eligibility of investors, well, we welcome the fact that there is a mechanism for, for uh, in addition to increasing the government funding, which is suggested to be uh, appropriated from the GAA. Uh, we welcome, of course, the, the public to invest in the HSC. Uh, special vehicle companies are a tool and maybe they should be listed in the stock exchange so there is uh, transparency and accountability no? when it comes to the eligibility of the investors and broadening the sources of funds, not only to healthy conglomerates investing in the HSEs, but allowing the public no, to invest. Uh, that would democratize the ownership of the so-called strategically important uh, companies that forms the industrial base of of Philippine business. Uh, uh, basically, uh, I, I cannot overemphasize the urgency of, of the plight of the aviation industry. And uh, we, of course, look forward to having this law uh, as soon as possible uh, and an expanded version to address the liquidity concerns of of the industry or for, for the Bureau of Treasury or the DBP, the LB, Land Bank of the Philippines, the Department of Finance to provide us with loan guarantees so that the private banks who are very skittish in lending more money to an injured industry will actually open the, the credit facility tabs. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. This is not even uh, equity. Um, Thank you, uh, Mr. Lim. We call on the president of Air Asia, and uh, we're quite uh, privileged that the uh, CEO uh, is here with us to directly uh, echo uh, what's happening um, with the airline industry, particularly his company. So we call on Mr. Isla. Yep. Uh, magandang umaga po sa inyong lahat. This is Ricky Isla of Air Asia. Thank you, Bobby, for... Uh, Attorney Bobby Lim for summarizing the state of uh, air travel, uh, airline companies, uh, especially this 2020, wherein it was really the most challenging. Uh, I just would like to uh, reinforce the fact that uh, we are still uh, hoping that we will be able to get what we call government support with regards to uh, bank guarantees for our companies such that we can also borrow money and infuse fresh capital that will drive our operations on a long-term basis. Why? Because right now we just had our uh, recent retrenchment and some of our employees are in for low. That's one. Uh, number two, uh, we're managing only about 20% uh, of our domestic flights and we're not flying on an international basis. As a matter of fact, there's this uh, latest... Uh, uh, IATF guidelines that, uh, again, we're going to restrict uh, majority of uh, international business or our international flights. Thus, the more that we have to cancel uh, or move our plans of uh, opening uh, international flights between June and July. But right now, we're concentrating on domestic. But we are only 20% of domestic. And if you're going to look at the total pie as far as flight resumption is concerned, since that is only 60% of total business, versus pre-COVID, we are only flying between 10 to 15. Or approximately, that's uh, a huge uh, reduction as far as our revenues are concerned. But moving forward, on the brighter side, uh, we've noted some good improvements this month of March for two reasons. One is because of the vaccine uh, rollout, which I think was uh, a major booster as far as the confidence of the passengers or the public in general. And number two, it's because it's the peak season. Normally, air travel is very strong during March up to June. Uh, 
as part of the summer uh, vacation that uh, a lot of people are are maximizing. However, since COVID is on the rise again, then we have to manage that situation. So thank you very much for this opportunity and uh, we hope that we will be able to continue our positioning as far as low price uh, air travel is concerned. We will be consistent to that and I think that will be very uh, helpful as far as uh, driving back the economy and tourism are concerned. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you uh, Mr. Isla. I would like to uh, ask uh, some questions to uh, Attorney Lim and uh, Mr. Isla can also uh, answer no, if he wishes to. Um, I, I just want to understand the Attorney Lim, the industry itself, no, because definitely top of mind industry that this uh, uh, law is uh, contemplating is the airline. If you talk about logistics, you talk about transportation, airline is probably a major player and a major component of that industry. So I would like to ask uh, um, the association, what is the current load factor now of the, uh, of, uh, the airline industry in terms of commercial passenger travel? I just want to get a, uh, a sense and a, a, an idea on... Uh, where the airline industry is right now? Well, uh, <clears throat> first of all, you have to look at it from the point of view of utilization of routes. Uh, we are, as a rule, we are only our pre traffic, our traffic levels or flight levels. We are only twenty percent. We are only using twenty percent of our flights compared to pre-COVID level. To give you an example, uh, on the average, let us say, uh, in 2019, in December, of, if you compare 2020 levels now, there were 13,392 flights in December of 2019. But in 2020, it's just last December, there were only 3,000 flights. So, you can see it's it, it's hovering about 20% or less. Uh, so the previous months prior to December, the loads were lower. So th that gives you an indication of how we're performing in terms of domestic flights. Compared to our neighbors, domestic flights in our neighbors have gone up to 50, 60, 80%. And the explanation for this is due to the fragmented policy when it comes to domestic travel. Uh, we do understand that the L LGUs uh, have different uh, conditions in their communities, but this also has led to a proliferation of policies and approaches. They have different requirements in terms of documentation, different requirements as to tests and clearances, and many of them impose uh, a number of flights per week and even number of passengers per aircraft. Matters within the exclusive prerogative of the Civil Aviation Authority of the Philippines. Now, we welcome, however, the, uh, the recent IATF and DILG initiatives to simplify the documentation and the type of uh, medical uh, examination and the rules on quarantine. Uh, that is an ongoing process. It was just started with the IATF resolution number 101 issued two weeks ago. And the various LGUs are implementing their own uh, ordinances to carry this out. But it still leaves the LGU the wide discretion on the local documentation needed uh, and coming up with a unified uh, requirements now. The simplification of travel requirements has an impact on the ability of the consumer to travel and their interest and appetite for travel. Uh, you know, when it's too complicated to travel, people will say, Chaka na lang. And uh, with the coming summer, uh, hopefully uh, more, more people travel, no? uh, at least domestically, because that is within the exclusive control of the Philippine government. Um, Mr. Isla, do you want to also respond yep. to that? 
Yeah, given that uh, we are flying only at a very limited number, uh, like for example, last December, we normally would fly about 4,000 flights a month. And that's peak season. But uh, last December, was we were only flying approximately at a high of 500 flights uh, concentrated on domestic. Uh, that's number one stat that I can share with you. Uh, I think in general, in average, given that we're only flying about 15 to 20%, a high of 20% of the domestic, right now the percent load factor is between a high of uh, 60 to an average of about 50 to 55 and uh, I think that's still low. However, this summer, we've noticed based on trending that uh, we're expecting a good uh, surge, uh, an in a good increase of about uh, a high of 60 to 65%. Because it's summer peak season, plus the fact that it's Holy Week, so we expect a lot of uh, passengers uh, concentrated, not only for tourism, but uh, again, people to visit their families in the provinces. Just to give uh, us and the body uh, greater appreciation, uh, so despite the 80% reduction in the number of flights, the load factor still remains at 50 to 60%. Still low, yes. Yeah. It's double whammy. You reduce your number of flights, but still people are wary of flying despite the reduction of uh, the number of flights. Yes. And I would like to ask uh, Attorney Lim also on the forecast. Now, I know this is a very difficult question to ask, uh, very difficult to to uh, come up with an uh, educated answer on this, but I just want to get uh, a sense from the airline experts on your forecast um, on the next coming uh, 12 months. What do you think? Uh, will passenger slash logistics uh, business pickup uh, in the airline industry? Well, uh, Mr. Chairman, it's uh, if we go by the estimates of, let's say, IATA, the International Air Transport Association, their projection shows that the on a global basis, in the airline industry will only recover in 2023-2024, to 2024. And that is subject, of course, to so many factors. No, you have first of all, you have the government policy, which is very restrictive. Uh, it is a reaction to battling and protecting their citizens, but the government policy has been quite restrictive because they are imposing travel requirements and quarantine, quarantine, and uh, this, of course, has a a. Uh, a negative effect or depressing effect on the ability of airlines to transport more passengers. Uh, another factor that has to be considered when we make a forecast would also be the rate of success uh, and uh, the vaccination process. Uh, in different parts of the world, we have different levels of performance in accessing the vaccine and their own program of vaccination, not to mention the fact that in different countries there is resistance by the citizenry to have themselves vaccinated. So it's a, it's a confidence game. Uh, it's, it's a confidence game, really. And, and the more success we have in vaccination process, the more uh, risk management approach is used by governments rather than just shutting off their borders uh, to travel mobility, then uh, the better it would be in terms of uh, reviving no, uh, the travel sector. Because risk management is the game. Uh, it, it cannot just be prohibiting people to come into your country. It is really regulating them through uh, layers of uh, biosecurity. No? from the protocols, health protocols that are strictly adopted by the airports and the airline sector. And we believe that the aviation sector is uniquely positioned to deal with these safety issues because it has a strong safety culture that antedates the COVID. No? Because of the inherent risk of flying, the, the 
culture of safety is already ingrained in the aviation sector because on a daily basis it deals with that risk. Uh, so we believe we are in a better, the aviation sector is in a better position to to manage uh, the movement of people. Aside from the fact that there is technology inside the aircraft that has been widely reported to minimize, if not totally remove, the risk of transmission inside the aircraft. No? How about uh, Attorney Lin, international travel? No, Because... Uh I've been seeing on television that a lot of European, the U.S. is on top of uh, vaccinating half of its population. Uh, and then, of course, the foreign travel or international travel uh, inbound is uh, one of the uh, better potentials. So, about international travel? Is that What is the forecast uh, on international travel? Yes, Senator. It's uh, according to IATA, the the revival or the recovery of the airline industry, no, uh, is around will happen in 2023 to 2024, and uh, that projection is based on the assumption that travel, international travel, will be open opening up, meaning to say countries will be opening their borders, will be relaxing border restrictions over time. So that's the demand side of aviation, uh, uh, Senator Gachelian. Uh, it, it's all linked to the movement of people and the movement of people, uh, the rate of their ability to move is all linked to not only their own confidence, but also to government policies. And um, uh, no, in the airline industry, the airline business is normally part of a bigger bigger conglomerate or a bigger group. And I uh, would like to inquire from uh, Attorney Lim or, or Mr. Isla uh, on the support from the parent company or the uh, mother company of these airline companies. Definitely, you cannot stop an airline without, without muscle. And um, typically, airlines are part of a very strong uh, group with uh, a lot of muscle to support it. So I'd like to inquire, you know, um, the support being given by affiliates or the mother company uh, to the airlines uh, yep. and pandemic. Yeah. Uh Thank you, uh, thank you very much, uh, Senator Win. Well, in the case of Air Asia, uh, when we noted that uh, there was already a significant impact on the business, we already uh, implemented a lot of revenue generating, which is non-traditional, to augment our uh, low sales. And uh, we opened up chartered flights for repatriation, uh, working with the uh, Overseas uh, Workers Welfare Association, or OWA, and at the same time, working with the different embassies on repatriation flights. Uh, an example of which, let's say, will be the most recent is China, Myanmar, and India. Uh, because of this, we were able to generate cash infusion. We were able to uh, get some cash inflow for the company. And while we noted that there's an improvement starting December and a better improvement starting this month of March, we think that... Uh, we still need some capital infusion from our mother company. In this case, because it's a 60-40 ownership, Philippines, 40% uh, Malaysia, uh, we've been getting some support, but on a minimum levels. But as far as we're concerned, we're currently managing also how we're able to uh, uh, submit a payment, uh, I would say payment uh, plans to all our creditors. So to date, I think, uh, we're still expecting a lot of organic growth from our business to build funds for our future operations. More on the organic business, Senator Wynn. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Isla. How about the other airlines, Attorney Lim? Uh, you know, Senator, uh, Mr. Chairman, with respect to Cebu Pacific, it's been reported in the papers that they have uh, borrowed, they have a program of borrowing from uh, the public. Uh, number one, they have a $250 million 
fundraising exercise through a stock offering on preferred convertible shares. And they are also, um, I believe, uh, finalizing some borrowings from banks in the amount of another $250 million. So a total of $500 million uh, is the financing that uh, being put in place by the Cebu Pacific Airlines. In so far as PAL is concerned, I understand that they are in the midst of uh, restructuring agreements with their creditors and aircraft lessors and uh, uh, proof that they are that they are uh, viable at this point in time is their ability to continue operating uh, repatriation flights um, domestic flights and of course uh, cash infusion from the owners of the airlines but uh, attorney, attorney Lee, I, I just want to play devil's advocate no? because if uh, these airlines can uh, refinance and have the ability to borrow some more uh, of the strength of their mother company, then you don't need this guide bid. Uh, I, is that, I, uh, is that a, 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 a fair assumption? Well, uh, I don't know to what percentage they will, th to say that they will not need it, I think is uh, maybe uh, not the best scenario for the airline industry. I mean, it's the present predicament of the local carriers is really on survival. Eh? We really don't know how long this predicament will continue to face the Philippine economy and and industries like the local carriers. No? When this pandemic started last year, people felt that, you know, this will just happen for two months and companies with a stronger balance sheet can, you know, easily uh, walk walk through the, the problem. But it has really lingered for longer. And... Uh, the damage to each of these airlines is far greater no? in the long run. We are not only, we have to look at not only survival today, which they are all trying to do, but we also have to look at recovery. And recovery requires another set of resources, you know. You mentioned earlier that uh, so far the airline has retrenched. Is that the right word for retrench or for yes? A uh, combination of yes. Uh, well, the generic term I would use is separation. They have either resigned, retrenched, or retired. It's a combination of all of those. Uh, initially, the each of these airlines tried to preserve their their organization in terms of manpower. These are highly skilled personnel. No, uh, Many of them uh, have built the experience. They are certificated. And losing these people means it will take a long time to also build the organization back when the recovery comes. So it will affect the competitive ability of the Philippine carriers when things go normal. And since the Philippine local carriers have not received any real big monetary and stimuli support compared to our neighbors, uh, relying solely on private resources will simply prolong their ability to recover and compete effectively you know, and expand for that matter to serve their mission yeah is the industry also looking to retrench some more for example if the situation uh, will not improve in the next 12 months uh, and then both uh, I would ask this to both attorney Lim and Mr. Isla are you looking to retrench some more uh, in the case of Air Asia I think we have reached the optimum level so there are no plans uh, but we at present have uh, employees that are on furlough, and as we increase our flights, 
because there was an improvement from January to March, we are actually to, uh, we have the, the priority plans to bring back uh, uh, in tranches this for low employees. But uh, as far as separation and retrenchments are concerned, there are no plans at, at present. Uh, we just hope that uh, the recovery is consistent and uh, we will be able to provide stable jobs, especially for our skilled engineers, pilots, and uh, uh, grounds people. How about the other airlines, Mr. Uh, Lim? Uh, I'm not aware of any uh, further plans, uh, Senator Gachelian, on the part of the two other carriers. I understand how... Uh, Airlines uh, uh, are very demanding and it demands uh, a lot of skilled uh, workers. And uh, during the recovery, you cannot just hire any Tom, Dick and Harry to join the airline because you need engineers, you have pilots, even the flight attendants undergo uh, months and months of training. So you cannot just hire anyone off the street and and then assign him to be a flight attendant. So uh, the, the intention really is, is to um, preserve as many skilled jobs as possible so that when during the up, upswing of our economy, hopefully soon, uh, the companies are ready to uh, take in more capacity. So as I'm asked, trying to un understand where the industry is right now and to put it on record. So thank you very much, Attorney Lim and uh, Mr. Isla, uh, for your thank uh, you, sir, uh, for your uh, very uh, candid uh, briefing. We also want to call on uh, thank you, thank you, Chairman, Mr. Winicky of AFI. Good morning, uh, Chairman Senator Gatolian. This is uh, Eric Kaeg, uh representing Sir George Winicky. I am joined by. Yes, sir. Uh, good morning, sir. And uh, Honorable Senators uh, Trilon and Marcos and the rest of the panel. I'm joined this morning by our founding member, Ms. Uh, Maria Teresa Dula Laurel. And um, I'd like to read a prepared statement from our association. So the Association of Filipino Franchisers Incorporated, or API, uh, the Philippine Superior Trade Organization, committed to enabling responsible micro Small and medium businesses and homegrown brands through franchising supports the MSME championing provisions in the proposed Senate Bill, an act of providing for government financial institutions, unified initiatives to distress enterprises for economic recovery. As an association primarily composed of Filipino entrepreneurs, business leaders, CEOs, presidents, and corporate executives in varying industries and enterprise, employing almost 100,000 of employees and operating more than 3,000 outlets nationwide with an annual generated sales for COVID of 54 billion pesos, we find the pro-MSME provisions in this legislation timely and relevant to the needs of small, micro, and medium entrepreneurs and businesses. For decades, we have been ardent supporters of government initiatives to champion our fellow MSMEs, even as we partner with multi-format retailers and establishments to spur economic activity and advance local innovations in several areas. The recent escalation of COVID-19 cases and deaths and the subsequent community quarantine declared by government in Metro Manila has lamentably disrupted the business environment. While we hope to remain optimistic about the economic outlook, this pandemic has led to unnecessary public unrest and observed dramatic decrease in our sales, owing to decreased foot traffic in public areas like malls, commercial centers, and the like. And in universities owning to class suspensions, coupled with other factors like increased foreign competition, increased input and logistical costs, this recent pandemic episode has made a lot of our business almost financially inviable. The provisions of expanding loan facilities by the DBP and Land Bank, along with the possibility of discounting existing loans to the guide law, provides the needed support by the MSMEs in accessing credit and in handling their financial obligations. The seemingly untenable situation brought about by the pandemic behooves to us collectively to seek support from our various partners, including Congress, to further push for the following. 
possible bank loan, holiday or extension of maturity loans, moratorium and in interest payments and penalties, uh, stop or hold potential foreclosures of our businesses, protect our credit information and history in the midst of possible credit defaults. While we see the wisdom of an integrated approach and unified framework for distressed enterprises, we are hopeful that this legislation will champion the MSMEs who bear the brunt of pandemic and are deemed most vulnerable with the least access to credit in these trying times. We trust that Congress will continue to go beyond the ambit of financial inclusion and support and also look deeper and take action in developing enabling infrastructure that makes running and sustaining businesses more viable for struggling, surviving, and aspiring entrepreneurs like ourselves. We hope to continue to work with Congress in championing small businesses like many of our members in API, Mabuhay po ang Senado, Mabuhay po ang Congreso, uh, signed Leon Flores, uh, Vice President for Policy and Research, Enrique Kai, Chairman, George Noel Winicky, President, and Maria Teresa Dula Laurel, Founding Member. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Now I'd like to recognize our founding member, uh, Mrs. Uh, Teresa Laurel, uh, just to expound on some points of uh, our letter. On Dix? Uh, we recognize Ms. La uh, Mrs. Laurel. Ma'am, you're on mute. Hello. Yes, we can hear you now. Okay. Well, actually, uh, good morning to Senator Wynn and to all the members of Congress and uh, to all those who are attending this hearing. Actually, our position paper was based on three assumptions that uh, we have for the organization. One is that 99.6% of all enterprise uh, belong to the MSMEs. And um, in terms of uh, building uh, uh, consumer confidence, which is very important in this time, um, I think it is our sector that can easily uh, spur that, uh, that confidence. Two, we feel that there are existing funds if only um, the financial institutions, whether private or government, can be tapped and monitored. Uh, we thank uh, Senator Aimee Marcos for bringing up the Magna Carta for small businesses, uh, that uh, the 8% of loan uh, or okay. of, of uh, banks be allocated for loans for the small business uh, enterprise and um, there are all there is already a 10 billion facility with uh, the DBP a 10 billion facility with the SV for bank we are not sure as they are more focused on the agricultural sector uh, but we still need help and we do not exactly know uh, whether the 10, the 10 billion facility in the guide program uh how much of it will really go to the to the msmes uh, the third assumption is that government support did not be financial only we also need infrastructure good uh business infrastructure for our sector and um chairman ka i guess already indicated or stipulated our wish list for the financial um uh, assistance mainly um, that there is a bank holiday and for the infra business infrastructure we'd like to to focus on some um, some existing practices in our sector and we'd like to to uh, request that our security deposits uh, with all our lessors, especially malls, be interest bearing, number one, interest bearing, and number two, that it can be converted as security. This runs into millions if uh, I think most of those in retail would agree with me. So 
um, there are also some un unfair trade practices in our industry. And uh, we'd also like to request the bracketing of uh, some employee benefits, meaning that uh, for the SM, SM, SM <laughs> um, the small business uh, businesses, we we can maybe um, uh, pay lower lower uh, employee benefits depending on the size or the the amount of employees that you have. Well, basically, those are the, the assumptions that we have, and we really thank everyone in the government, especially the financial institutions, for initiating uh, this Senate hearing. Thank you very much. Thank you, Senator. Thank you, thank you Mr. Eric. Mr. Eric, I have some questions. No, uh, after hearing your uh, comments earlier, uh, just to give us, just to give me some uh, idea on where uh, MSMEs are. No, of course, Afi is not the representative of the entire MSME industry because there are about a million, close to a million. But just to give me an idea, no, because your group is composed of entrepreneurs and and micro small businesses. How many of your members have closed shop? Well, uh, from the last uh, survey that we had moving towards December 2020, there are about almost 25% that have uh, chose to close, uh, not all, but uh, some of their branches that are really bleeding and losing money. And uh, it, uh, for our organization, uh, out of 100%, 36% are company-owned and 64% uh, are franchisee-owned. Okay. So uh, with the uh, with the drop of foot traffic, uh, in particular uh, areas of which most of our most of our members are actually in the malls, uh, we we were able to receive support from the malls. But then again, on the longer term, since sales cannot actually uh, support break even, some of them have actually prepared to close uh, losing uh, branches. So. Uh, the uh, the other brands have opted to collaborate with uh, existing retailers outside the mall and do what we call co-branding. Some of our brands have uh, resorted to what we call the trend today, which is a uh, uh, cloud kitchen. But this cloud kitchen uh, literally means that the brands uh, operate and uh, they market digitally. Uh, they get orders digitally, but then again, they do have to resort. Uh, to manpower reductions just because the stores are not uh, there at the moment. So uh, before COVID, we were actually doing an employment impact of 96,500 plus, and uh, we have around uh, close to 400 members pre-pandemic, and this has uh, greatly been reduced in 2020. So... So, tama po ba, uh, Mr. Eric, that the 25% of your branch, the branches of your members have closed? Yes, sir. And then, uh, how many employees were uh, displaced? Uh, the 25% uh, closure created? Uh, roughly, uh, roughly. Roughly. Well, roughly, sir, siguro, maaram a thousand plus uh, because uh, we are nationwide and uh, most of our members are into uh, kiosks and carts and like Mam Fix is into a uh, full sit-down uh, restaurant and averaging uh, number of employees per door minimum of three for a kiosk maximum for a restaurant would be around 20. So we have different members, not only from uh, the food and beverage sector, we, we have from uh, services, we have from petroleum, uh, we have uh, members who are into uh, suppliers or our suppliers like myself. Uh, and uh, we're actually in that uh, moment where, as it was said earlier in the, in the airline industry, surviving is one thing, recovery is another. So we're looking forward to uh, supporting each other 
towards uh, you know halting the closure of our stores. So all of us are actually doing our uh, support to one another. We're trying to integrate our businesses in one location, multi brands in one location, multi stores in one cloud kitchen to be able to spur uh, sales and uh, employment for our uh, members in our sector. How about uh, Mr. Eric? Uh, um, in terms of uh, this law, no, itong guide bill, how will this guide bill help the MSMEs? You've, you've heard the briefing earlier, and no? there are two components, one for MSMEs, one for strategically important companies. No? Uh, in, in the MSMEs, component of the bill, how will it help your entrepreneurs like yourselves uh, to survive and to recover eventually? Yes, uh, we saw the features of the bill and uh, somehow there are uh, parallel uh, existing uh, benefits already in terms of lowered interest uh, for, for loan applications. Uh, somehow, uh, what uh, Ma'am Tix has already said earlier, other frameworks that would be able to help us is, uh, for example, uh, most of our members who have loans or either defaulted payments uh, with their different responsibilities uh, would, in one way or another, would have credit history already. And this would be uh, you know, data that would uh, probably hinder the, an approval later on. Uh, because for most, uh, especially with those brands that have larger branches that have resorted to closure, for example, we have one uh, brand who seemed to uh, uh, clothes uh, altering and he has around uh, 50 branches nationwide and that has been cut uh, into, into half. And somehow uh, resorting to selling of their own personal assets uh, just to be able to uh, cope up with the financial obligations. So somehow the features of this bill, uh, which is uh, beneficial to us, uh, we would request uh, certain enhancements uh, towards capability of uh, SMEs or MSMEs uh, to catch up with uh, a lot of uh, payments in their fault. Yeah, because you mentioned, Mr. Eric, earlier that uh, uh, you, you request, you would rather request bank loan, holiday, interest holiday. Um, so what I'm getting from these entrepreneurs is uh, don't, don't uh, uh, saddle us with more loans, but instead help us... Uh, uh, extend our existing loans. Is that what is that a right message that I'm getting from the entrepreneurs? Yes, uh, Senator Wynn, uh, that's that's one uh, because we've already been invited uh, by different uh, sectors like SP Corp. Uh, we've already done uh, two town halls with them and. Uh, Somehow, some of our members have already applied. Uh, however, moving forward in terms of our industry into franchising, because that's the business model that our group is in, uh, we would like also to support potential franchisees to be able to, you know, uh, for those who are displaced workers, OFWs who are coming, uh, we had a, a an activity with, with OWA uh, for those uh, uh, OFWs being uh, reintegrated uh, in our country, uh, we've done a franchise pitch for them, and some of them actually need assistance in terms of loans. And uh, this would be the other stakeholder in our business model who would need those loans. Because uh, uh, we're talking about franchisors earlier, and the other half of our model is the franchisees. And for those who are uh, needing to go to uh, you know, new endeavors, uh, employees who've lost their jobs, uh, as I said earlier, uh, OFWs who uh, opted from home. We are actually offering 
uh, affordable packages. In fact, some of our franchisers have waived uh, franchise fees for them to be able to uh, afford uh, the packages that we have. But somehow, the franchisees would still need uh, budget or, or finances uh, in terms of creating the store much as if we will also waive our fees, but we will need to create the store, buy equipments, buy stocks from, from the franchisers. So yes, Senator Wynn, uh, uh, the, the features of this bill uh, towards the stakeholders of our franchising industry is very, very helpful. Yeah, but uh, Mr. Eric, the loan packages uh, being uh, uh, contemplated in this bill, uh, are for MSMEs affected by the COVID-19 pandemic. So in other words, uh, for example, you're a franchisee or a franchisee, a franchisor, uh, you should be, uh, you should have been affected by the COVID-19 pandemic to be able to secure more loans. But uh, what I'm trying to appreciate is to small do MSMEs like yourselves who are affected by uh, the COVID-19 pandemic want more loans? Well, uh, generally the answer, Senator, is yes. Uh, for those who are uh, wanting to, well, those who have not yet pivoted their business, those who have temporarily halted their business and wanted to, to pursue because while some of them have uh, cease operating uh, in the malls, they are transferring to other locations. So capital uh, has already been depleted and uh, they need loans to pursue uh, continuation of business. Okay, so this will be helpful. It is the loan package from DDP uh, to MSMEs affected by COVID-19. Yes, Mr. Chairman. In the law, it doesn't... Uh, does it have any feature on bank holiday or interest holiday? Yeah? So that's an entirely different uh, law. In fact, that's in Bayani and one which uh, expired already. So uh, just to uh, flag you on that. Uh, but we'll take note on, on those comments because it's important. Eh? Now, what we don't want is for our entrepreneurs to saddle with a lot of loans. Uh, some of them don't need loans. They just need reprieve, temporary reprieve from those loans in order to survive. But uh, it might not be a good idea to uh, saddle them with more loans. In, in the long run, they might not be able to pay those. No? So that's also one thing. So thank you very much, uh, Mr. Eric, for those uh, uh, feedback. And last on our private sector is Preba, represented by... Uh, Charmin Albacite. Hi, Mr. Senator. Good morning. Uh, we Hi. are actually the, the, the Chamber of Real Estate and Builders Associations, or CREBA, is actually in the process of evaluating the bills that have been filed um, regarding the uh, towards the Guide Act. Uh, we will be submitting our detailed position on the matter, sir, once we have concluded our evaluation of the bills presented. Thank you, Mr. Senator. Right. Uh, just submit to us your position paper because um, uh, uh, real estate is uh, part of uh, the covered um, uh, industry. So uh, I want to move back to... Uh, yes, sir, we will do. Thank you very much. Thank you. I want to move back to the government agencies. Uh, I would like to call on COA for their position uh, on the said uh, proposal. Good morning, Your Honors. Morning. Morning. Uh, Yes. Attorney. Good 
Attorney Diano? Attorney Diano? Yes, Attorney, can you, uh, uh, you're coming Hello, in very chat. Uh, please repeat from the beginning because we didn't hear any of your uh, statements. Uh, okay, Guillaume. Uh, the Commission Audit would like to manifest that we already forwarded yesterday to this Honorable Committee on Banks, Financial Institutions, and Currencies through a the COA fully supports the Congress in its aim to assist in the rehabilitation of the district businesses, specifically the micro, small, and medium enterprises and strategically important corporations by providing them a timely and effective access to credit and finance. Attorney Kiano? I think we'll uh, move on to uh, another agency uh, while uh, Attorney Kiano is fixing her bandwidth. Uh, attorney, you're yeah. I I can see you, but you're you're yes, coming in, you're coming in on and off. Attorney <laughs> Kiano. Uh, sir, low bandwidth po ang COBA, kaya po naglalag sila. Tuloy po tuloy. Uh, Comsec, uh, let's request from Ko uh, Adian. Sir Nicano? Yes, Sir Honor. Happy. So, uh, can you just read uh, very quickly and briefly the, the, the uh, position of Ko? Yes. During the first yes, during the first public hearing last week, Your Honor, the Honorable Committee inquired on co Section Nine of Senate Bills twenty o three and twenty forty eight and House Bill seventy seven forty nine, which would allow the services of a private auditing firm to audit the special holding company, which is a government owned con or controlled corporation, to be created. Of the Development Bank of the Philippines and Land Bank of the Philippines. We would like to manifest that while a private auditing firm may be authorized by law to audit the and the investments of DDP and Land Bank, COA is still mandated on the Constitution to examine and audit the accounts and transactions. So Comsec uh, will just request for a position paper. Yes, sir. We have we have a copy sir, of the call position paper. Papa uh, says she's uh, coming in in and out. Eh. Uh, yes, sir. We have a copy of the position paper of Kova. Okay. Uh, I want to go back uh, on. Uh, uh, I want to go back to our uh, government uh, offices, uh, POF, Land Bank, and uh, DBP. Um, this is 
a job preservation bill. No? And uh, a lot of the uh, um, motivation here is to preserve jobs until we uh, go back to pre-COVID levels. Uh, that being the case, uh, one of the methodologies um, indicated in the bill is to in invest in strategically uh, important companies. In the meantime, those companies will become quite risky you know, uh, because of uncertainty, because of the, uh, what's happening uh, around the world. We don't know how long and how deep uh, the rehabilitation process and the survival uh, mode of those companies. So my question is uh, to the OF Land Bank and DBP is uh, what is the, the benefit uh, compared to the risk uh, involved in investing in those companies? Have we quantified the job preservation benefit in terms of value, in terms of aggregate demand versus investing in what I call, at least for now, uh, risky and um, temporary insolvent companies. No? Have we compared those, uh, have we conducted a cost-benefit analysis so that we understand um, uh, the value uh, in terms of job preservation versus investing in these SICs? Any of the agencies can uh, respond there. Yeah, yes, Gian. Um, good, good morning, po, Senator Gachalian. So, um, based on our presentation earlier, po, in terms of financials, lang po, um, there is benefit talaga on the side of um, the SHC because investing in these companies, assuming that all of these companies would would recover, would um, earn a return investment for us of 9.63%. Uh, and 9.63% right now, given the low interest rate environment that we have, is already a very decent return. Po. Now, on the side naman po of on the employment generation, um, as I've mentioned earlier, po, um, these 15 SICs um, have a total of about of more than 100,000 employees. So if ever we help them, then we save the jobs of this 100,000 employees. And I would just like to um, highlight po, that this 100,000 employees, these are just direct um, employees of the company. So this would not include yung mga employees ng um ng mga companies that are related to these SICs, yung mga downstream and upstream companies. Just to give you some example po, um, for the airline industry, as mentioned by the IATA report, um, one job in the airline and industry would be able to create 20, 27 other jobs in related industries. Po, po. So that would be for the airline industry, a multiplier of 27 jobs. Now, for these other industries, uh, we haven't uh, seen any study, po, but it would be uh, safe to assume that these other companies, given their linkages, also have multiplier effects in terms of the number of jobs saved. Now, in terms of the value naman po of the, um, to the economy, if we save these SICs, again, we're just simply talking here about the 15 SICs that we've initially um, identified. So, um, total linkages po would be more than 5 trillion. Um, and in terms of share of total nominal GDP as of 2020, um, it is between 11 to 18 percent, um, whether uh, if we look at it on the uh, forward linkages or the backward linkages aspect. So mga 11 to 18 percent for the um, 15 companies. So if, for example, based on what um, Senator Durlon said earlier, that we expand the list of um, SICs to beyond 15, then we might probably be talking about of larger benefits to the um, macroeconomy, po, more than the 18 to 11 to 18 percent that are currently um, more or less contributed by these 15 SICs that we have identified, po, Senator. But then let me focus on close to um, and that's all. So I just want to um, see cost benefit on that 19,000 
First was in in uh, SIC. Pair it in terms of the Can you hear me? Uh Ian? Hear the um entire question po Senator. I'm not able to um can you hear me now? Grasp yung question po talaga. Yes, Senator, I can hear you, but sometimes po, um, signal comes in choppy po. Somebody's... Uh, I, uh, somebody said. But okay. Can you hear me, Dia? Yes, boss. Okay. Now, what I'm saying is close to everyone's heart. And I want to uh, want to see a cost-benefit analysis focusing on job preservation. Just to compare it with what we're plowing in support to SI. Just to make it a uh, value have a cost benefit okay. job presentation the cost involved in, uh, in this SICs um you're breaking up po kanina but um, from what I've gathered based on your comment, po, Senator, am I correct po in understanding that what you want po is a cost-benefit analysis as to the value that um, investment in SICs would have in terms of employment, in terms of economic um, value added versus the amount of money invested into the SHC, which is currently at $10 billion po. Is that what you uh, mean, po, Senator? Sorry, yes, po, Mr. Chuck. Yes, yes. I, I, that's what I think it is uh, uh, in earphone. Gian, I think it's your earphone that is uh, uh, that is grounded. The wire ng earphone mo grounded. Yeah, Gian, can you hear me? Yes, Senator. Yeah, yeah, better. I think it's your other headphone that is uh, yeah. causing the distortion. Um, Sorry for that. Part. What I'm saying is, have you run a cost-benefit analysis purely on job preservation versus on, let's say, the ten billion that we are investing? Uh, just to make it simple, I'm making it very simple, no, so that people are, will understand. Now, what we're saying is we're preserving jobs in exchange for investing $10 billion in companies that are currently, uh, I would say, risky because of their solvency issues. So have we weighed on that in terms of value? Um, Senator, if I may answer po that question po based on um, the available information that I have right now, po. Um, if we, for example, assume that once we invest money for 10 billion into these SHCs, and then eventually um, this 10 million would um, ripple down to employees in the form of salaries to the employees of the company itself, and also salaries to the suppliers of these SICs, then we might probably be talking about uh, Mr. Senator of a spending multiplier for the Philippines of times two. So if we inject 10 million into the SICs and this 10 million would become salaries eventually down the line and it will be spent by these um, um, employees, then a spending multiplier of two might probably um, take effect. So that would be 20 billion, Paul, Mr. Senator. 
So to put it in simple terms, uh, an investment of 10 billion will yield to a benefit of uh, 20 billion in terms of job preservation because their salaries will be preserved. Yes, but, uh, Mr. Senator, that assumes but, that the 10 billion will eventually go to the pockets of households as salaries to the um, employees of the SICs and to the employees of the suppliers of these SICs. Po. I, I know you. Uh, this is a rough calculation, but please submit to us a more detailed uh, analysis, cost-benefit analysis on uh, purely on the job preservation versus uh, the investment that uh, we are contemplating. Um, yes, po, Senator. Uh, just submit it to the committee na lang. Um, we, have, we will have it on record. Um, with that, uh, Senator Aimee, any, any, any questions from our... Yes. Uh, ano? Yes, Mr. Chair, I actually had to step out because I had to join the e-vape and tobacco hearing to know where we come from and uh, the products that are always involved tobacco. So without apology, I uh, just wanted to inquire, um, are we agreed that as an additional safeguard, since I've been fixated on safeguards on this holding company, uh, it should be listed publicly in the stock exchange for transparency and accountability. I'm not sure that that was uh, uh, concluded last uh, hearing. But it was asked earlier by Attorney Lim, but uh, we can direct that question to uh, the DOF uh, and uh, they can respond uh, to that concept. I think in addition to that, uh, perhaps uh, uh, this listing would really help us. It's also good for the capital market and retail investors. Um, my, my, my question would be, kung 51% yan, no, kasi LBP, FBBP, magkano mare-raise? What do we intend to raise? Tapos magbabago. Uh, if ever, uh, swerte yun tayo at uh, makapag-raise ng marami. Um, uh, will that change the ownership and... Uh, the other question, of course, would be the BSP. Would it allow? Would it allow this as a uh, prudent and profitable investment for private banks? Yumpo. Uh, DOF, um, any any comments, or you may respond to uh, the query of uh, Senator Aimee. Um, Mr. Chairman and Senator Aimee, on the first question, Paul. Uh, we're lo really looking at publicly listed companies because, as you have mentioned, po, now we want some uh, trans greater transparency, and of course, now we would be able to access documents uh, that were also submitted to SEC, uh, so that, uh, and of course to our BIR. So there would be uh, different uh, channels of uh, validation to ensure that uh, the financial statements uh, are credible and also in terms of their own financial performance. Yes, sure, sure, Leah. I guess the question would be is that uh, uh, the SHC itself would be listed on uh, the stock exchange. Uh, for now, Hindi po, ma'am, uh, because uh, this, um, what we are contemplating at the moment when we start is that it will really be um, full um, ownership but by our two GFIs. And then eventually, as we see that there would be some multilaterals that would also be uh, encouraged or attracted to put in their own funds, then um, ultimately po, uh, when we win away the two GFIs, and then it will, mm, could be taken over by the private sector. I suppose this addresses the issue that uh, has been raised repeatedly during this hearing, which is that 10 billion is a really meager amount um, to revitalize the economy. And one way uh, would be to get capital, uh, to go for capital in the private market. So, yun ang sinasa just natin. That would also really help us in terms of transparency and accountability, given that, as we know, despite the heroic efforts of OA, they're really post facto and post mortem. So, yun nga, yun ang uh, naiisip natin. That could be another uh, way to respond. Yes, ma'am. Uh, we can explore that uh, um, avenue po in terms of how we will be able to uh, further in, uh, increase the capitalization of the SHC. Thank you much. Uh, perhaps we can uh, take a look at that and uh, 
uh, the BSP would also weigh in um, whether this would be a sound investment for local banks because right now what we are talking about are uh, some previously very profitable companies that I'm certain uh, private investors would be interested in. Uh, Mr. Chair, if I may, uh, this is Attorney uh, Arifa Ayla from the Banco Central of Filipinas. Yes, go ahead. Uh, well, uh, with respect to the 10 billion as proposed in the uh, in the guide bill, since uh, once this is passed into law, there's already an authority mandated under the law for the land bank and the DBP to uh, to invest the 10 billion into the SHC. So that one is uh, by operation of law would be allowed. But of course, there might be breaches in terms of the prescribed ceilings under the manual of regulations for banks. So what we will do is to require Land Bank and DBP to submit action plans to the BSP on how they will uh, eventually be able to address those breaches. Of course, they, they would need some time to uh, eventually be able to reduce uh, uh, the, the their shareholdings in such a way that they will be able to meet the prescribed ceilings. As to the question on whether uh, or not other private banks may be allowed to invest in the SHC, uh, based on the proposed bill, um, there was no mention about private banks. It was more of a pr private sector, um, most probably from the multilater multilateral agencies. But if and when a uh, private bank would be uh, interested to invest, for example, in the SHC, uh, it will be subject to the approval of the monetary board. And of course, before we grant or uh, approve uh, such proposal, uh, we will do evaluation on how uh, on the impact, for example, of such investment into the overall condition of the um, investing uh, private bank, uh, Mr. Chair. Yes, thank you very much to the BSP, to Attorney Ala. Maraming salamat and uh, to my chair. Uh, certainly, uh, we're aware that this amount is very small and uh, any other effort to generate more um, amounts would be welcome and one of those would be to simply go to the capital market. However, we're also aware that the special holding company can only retain its tax privileges if it remains a GOCC. And the LBP and the DPP, therefore, need to retain majority ownership. So uh, I, uh, su I uh, suppose in the TWG, we uh, enjoin the chairman uh, to look into these possibilities, given that the guide bill is largely patterned after the TARP. Uh, bill and law of the United States in 2008, and uh, it had so many critics, largely because it ended up being a reward for bad behavior, it ended up being uh, the source of the notorious TARP bonuses for the executives, so it's essential that we plug all the holes and uh, the potential for abuse. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Senator Marcos. Um, the Treasurer Leah, uh, as I'm looking at the bill right now, no? um, what is the proposed authorized capital of the special holding company? Ten, ten billion, sir. So that's, that's the proposed authorized capital. Oh, that's uh, but, uh, so what if you, you want to uh, increase it? Um, of course, um, but of course, the paid up, sir, we will be really confined only to the 10 billion because that's the amount of funds that we have for now. Correct, correct. But what if, uh, let's say, uh, Congress will say, oh, let's uh, add some more. But if the authorized is only 10, then you can only be allowed to take in 10. Yes, uh, we're open, Senator, uh, if Congress would allow an increase in terms of the authorized capital. Yeah, but it's not in the law, no? The authorized. We did not for indicate in the law. So that means the uh, uh, the UF will be tasked to um, come up with the with the recommended or with the appropriate authorized capital. We'll we'll look into that, uh, Senator. Because initially, sir, as uh, again, we were contemplating to wind down in the long GFI, so they will be. Uh, you know, un unwinding their shareholdings in the SHC. Uh, all right. 
No, but it's, it's, it's not like a low... Um, Mr. Chair, um, I would just like to uh, uh, lend my support to your and Senator Lilon's uh, um, sense that, uh, in fact, uh, there is uh, room to increase this uh, bill, if not in the actual bill today, in the future, uh, given that the amounts we have borrowed will be sufficient to provide financial space for all the needs of our MSMEs, such as Eric and the rest. After all, um, Bayanihan 1 and 2 are expiring, and we all know it will take a long time for the economy to finally bounce back. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Army. Thank you for that manifestation. Definitely, it will uh, set uh, the tone and the direction for the committee to take. And uh, being a, a author of this bill, I would really like to uh, uh, get your comments and your direction on how to proceed uh, with the uh, proposed measure. Uh, so going back to uh, Treasurer Leah, can we include already the authorized capital in the bill? Yes, so sir. That, uh, that we can increase it later on, depending, of course, to the availability of your uh, cash flow. Yes, sir. And also, if there would be non-government uh, who would want to participate and ship in. Right. So with that, uh, I, would, I don't have any more questions. Senator Aimee, any more questions? So, um, I uh, don't think so. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, I see the hands of DBP. Yes, ma'am. Members of the committee. Yeah, good morning, uh, Honorable Chair and members of committee. This is Soraya Adyong from DBP. With respect to the issue on the authorized capital stock of the special holding company, since it will be incorporated under the uh, SEC rules, then we have flexibility to adopt a higher ACS in the Articles of Incorporation. It, it need not be in the law, but of course we would welcome a higher a higher uh, paid up capital. But the authorized capital will be contained in the articles of incorporation. What is being contemplated by uh, by uh, P and land bank? So authorized capital. For now, for now, it's just ten billion, but we can we are flexible, uh, Mr. Chair. Okay, all right. We'll we'll work together on uh, on uh, a possibility of uh, embedding that in the law, just to give uh, a signal that uh, government is willing to um, uh, spend this much no? or a bigger amount. Uh, authorized lang naman siya. It doesn't mean that we will pump in money, but it gives a signal on the size. So with that, uh, any more questions from the panel? Thank you. Thank you very much, Senator Aimi, and uh, thank you very much for your participation and definitely being... Wow, air condition, ang ganda ng mga kwaan, siya na siya. So, yung ating provision on this, itong... Senator Ivy, you're unmuting... Hi, Indy, thank you, thank you. I, uh, I, I'm, uh, I'm just trying to raise volume, thank you. <laughs> so, it's not meant to prejudice anyone, obviously, if there's someone who can understand. Lively debate on the other committee. Sorry, sorry. Oh, nga, narinig ko si Senator Pia. Sorry about that. Kaya nga. But uh, again, thank you very much, Senator Marcos, for your participation and your inputs. And uh, your bill will be uh, uh, one of the bills that will be uh, used to uh, push this uh, measure forward. And uh, again, to our resource persons, especially to uh, the DOF, Land Bank, DBP, uh, would like to um, uh, again put on the table the possibility of increasing 
the 10 billion uh, initial capital to even more, um, Treasurer Lia. Um, I think there's a mutual sentiment among the senators to increase it some more. Uh, so let's work on that. And then... Uh, yes, Kerwin, lagay na nang natin ang proviso na pwedeng dagdagan. Yes, yes, definitely. Well, it, 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 upon reading it, the law, uh, the infusion of capital to DBP and Land Bank is a signal that they can probably invest no, uh, in the special holding company in the future. But it's not so clear uh, that the... Will go to that. No, it can be used for other things. So we just need to work with uh, Treasurer Lia on the language if that is the intention. And I think that is the intention. No, uh, uh, after hearing the uh, resource persons, and then second, I uh, would like to get feedback from Treasurer Lia on uh, the possibility of the multilaterals entering at the beginning. And this is just a suggestion that we want to put on the table, and then. Um, strengthening the language of employment preservation in the law because definitely that's close to the hearts of everyone and we all agree you know, everyone in this panel agrees that uh, the primordial uh, goal of this law is to uh, preserve um, employment so those are the things that uh, we have discussed today and uh, uh, we'd like to request from our resource person to submit their respective position papers if they have more to say other than what they have uh, intimated in this uh, hearing and uh, the next step will be a technical working group and once again we would like to invite everyone to participate uh, because that will be discussing the uh, nitty-gritty and uh, all the details in the bill so again thank you very much senator Ivy, treasurer lia to land bank uh, to dbp and of course to all our resource persons thank you very much for uh, your time and your input uh, on today's hearing. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, everyone. Salama po. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Aimee. Oh, oh,